Uh, good evening. I hereby call the Palm Springs regu regular City Council meeting of September 29, 2022 to order. Uh, first item of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. At this time, I invite all who are able to join me in standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, City Clerk, please conduct a roll call. Council Member Holstedge. Council Member Kors. Here. Council Member Woods. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Here. Mayor Middleton. Present. We have four members present. And we do expect Council Member Holstage to join us. Uh, as I understand it, there are no presentations this evening. Mayor, we did want to introduce some of our newest executive team members. Ah, very briefly, good, please. May. Thank you. Um, this evening we have with us our new city clerk, Brenda Pree. She joined Brenda's. Our new city clerk, she joined us in September and was previously the city clerk for Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, she holds a bachelor's of science in business administration and a certified master's municipal clerk and election registration administrator. We're so pleased to have her on our team. Welcome, Brenda. Also, we have Chris Hadwin and Lindsay Page L.P. McCloy joining us. Uh, Chris is our new planning director. He joined us in August. He was formerly the director of planning and for the New York City Department of Cities Planning in Staten Island Borough. And he was with the New York City Planning Department for seven years. We are very pleased to have him join us as well. And Lindsay Page McCloy has joined us as the new sustainability director. She has been with us since August. Prior to taking this position here, she was the program director for the pilots project team at Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator, where she led a team that identified, designed, implemented, and evaluated clean tech pilot projects in Los Angeles County. She works with startups, cities, and other partners to build inclusive green economy in the region. So we're very happy to have her on board as well. Thank you for the opportunity to introduce our new employees. And welcome to you all, and welcome to Palm Springs. With that, we have the acceptance of the agenda uh, the City Council will discuss the order of the agenda, may amend the order, add urgency items, note abstentions or no votes on consent calendar items, or request consent calendar items be removed for a separate discussion. The City Council may also remove items from the consent calendar prior to that portion of the agenda. At this time, I would entertain a motion for the acceptance of the agenda are there any items that staff or a council member would like removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion and or a vote? Uh, Teresa? Yes, Mayor and Council, I just have a clarification on a consent agenda item. For item 1O, we would like to, in light of new information, staff would like to exclude the parts and office assistant from the recommended reclassifications until other further review can take place. Thank you. Thank you. And council, are there any items to remove? Well, that's a record for us. So, a uh, report of the closed session, uh, Mr. Ballinger. Yes, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, members of the public, the City Council met in closed session earlier this afternoon uh, to discuss the items that are listed on the agenda. Uh, there was no reportable action. All right. Next item is public testimony. At this, this time has been set aside for members of the public to address the City Council on non-public hearing agenda items only. Two minutes will be assigned to each speaker. You are asked to please begin your time by telling us what agenda item or items you are speaking about. Please note the testimony for public hearings will be taken at the time of the public hearing and general public comment for subjects not on the agenda will be taken later in this evening. Uh, we do have a number of speakers, so please, uh, this is your time, and please uh, feel very welcome to use it, but if what you wanted to say has already been said very well, you do have the option of saying, 
Mr. or Miss said what I wanted to say very well. Thank you. <laughs> City Clerk, do we have any registered speakers? Yes, ma'am. Hank Plant, followed by Michael Joseph Pitkin and Dean Levine. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Hank Plant. It's nice to see you. And uh, I'm here to talk about the uh, STR report that you're going to be getting tonight from our work group. I really enjoyed being on it. Uh, I think we've come up with a fair plan uh, that balances between the neighborhoods and the industry. I want to thank the City Council for uh, taking this issue on. I know it's not easy. I really want to thank the City staff, uh, Teresa and uh, Patrick and Veronica are, were so terrific and they guided us through, it was like herding cats. Uh, we all had different opinions. We, I think for the most part, we uh, put those opinions on hold and we came up with something thinking about what's best for the city. Uh, and you know, we're looking for balance. Um, I know that you're uh, kind of being lobbied, if that's the right word, maybe to pass a citywide ban, but not a neighborhood ban. Uh, I think that would be a mistake because it would not uh, uh, stop uh, the uh, in incrosion uh, into our neighborhoods of uh, the growing number of STRs. I mean, you've got neighborhoods that are 39%, 28%, 27%. How much is enough? I think the only way to arrest that uh, is to put a neighborhood cap on. We're suggesting 10%. It's very generous. We've only got 7% now citywide. I think the whole plant's generous. Um, I would say that uh, under this recommendation, nobody loses. Anybody who has a vacation rental permit right now gets to keep it. The city gets to keep the money that's coming in. Uh, and slowly, uh, the neighborhoods will see fewer uh, vacation rental homes. Uh, I would ask you to remember what's written on the doorway we all walked in tonight. The people are the city. Thanks. This is in regards to MPNV, Michael Joseph Pitkin, a resident of Palm Springs, one year. I am 57 years old, Democrat, homosexual, HIV positive, and cancer, multiracial, European, theistic, Satanist male, unhoused, unemployed. In that year, I lost my HUD Section 8 voucher. I was denied duty of care medical care. Duty of Re Department of Rehab Gay Employment in Palm Springs. I still cannot vote. My phone's hacked and many online accounts I still cannot access. I moved here to be with my older gay demographic. I came here with willingness to work together and was met with retaliation and revenge. No white individual should discriminate. The black and indigenous communities that history has harmed will need to come to terms amongst themselves about their own reverse discrimination. Two wrongs do not make a right. I dispute your law enforcement deterrence program, cease and desist. Today, I ask for number one, a new public free workable payphone in Palm Springs, sir, California. Sir, what agenda item are you speaking on? M, P, and V. I Free from social service law enforcement, cameras, and monitoring. Number two, a couple new public free virtual Zoom meeting rooms at the library or Palm Springs Chamber of Commerce that are VPN HIPAA compliant. Number three, an adults only VPN internet at the library in its own consenting adults area. Number four, Lieutenant Hutchinson is asking for two Palm Springs mobile crisis response team members on the Palm Springs police force. They will address matters that affect the unhoused as well as emergency concerns in the Palm Springs inclusive manner. Hell, gay, Satan. Dean Levine, followed by Randall Sturgis and David Feltman. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council people. Um, I'm just call, uh, coming up about the uh, parklets. I know you guys have a vote tonight on whether to extend them for one year. Uh, I believe you guys have letters from numerous stakeholders and people in response. One of them are mine. Just wanted to put a face to it. 
Um, and just remind you that there are only nine of them. Uh, there's some feedback that I've heard that there's issues with parking. I believe the impact on parking is minimal. Um, in my letter, you can see where we've addressed it where we are. Uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up is it does revenue, generate revenue in taxes and rental fees. And we are currently faced with a recession. So anything we can do to help uh, parklets uh, goes a long way. And the last thing is if there are issues, we, I was on one of the, uh, on the uh, committee for design standards on these. Uh, the design standards for these parklets are somewhat stronger than the design standards we have for many of the, the buildings that we have. So if there are issues with parklets uh, or any individual one, I would urge the council to address what was in the standards that the council adopted in terms of enforcing issues with any individual parklets. And that's it. Thank you. Randall Sturgis, followed by David Feltman and Keith Ruoff. Thank you. I'm Randall Sturgis, and I'm speaking with regard to the neighborhood cap and the uh, possible ADA compliance issue. And I'm speaking against both. Um, as far as the cap in the neighborhoods, the committee has not really uh, explained why this is a problem. Uh, it's not noise. We have one of the strictest noise ordinances in the country. Some have framed it as an issue of changing character in the neighborhoods, but their own statistics disprove that. If you want a neighborhood get together or cook out, three out of four of your neighbors are not renting, and the fourth may not be renting. Um, what this measure would do is reduce taxes from permits, from rental taxes, and that will be significant if the study is made. The second effect of this measure would be to depress property prices. When buyers can't use rental income to help defer some of their costs, they'll pay less. That's simple economics. Uh, the voters of Palm Springs made it clear that they want these rentals and the millions of dollars in the coffers of the city and that they want the restaurant scene and the boutiques that these holiday makers provide for us. And we've elected the most diverse, one of the most diverse city councils in America, and now that council is being presented with a measure that would subvert the very will of the people who elected them. As far as the ADA issue goes, um, I think that this measure isn't even in the spirit of the ADA legislation, which carves out houses and any lodging structure with less than five rooms. Uh, did the committee look at any towns that have forced compliance in this issue? Is there even a single town out of the 400 plus towns in America that have short-term rentals that has this compliance? The committee likens these ADA issues, uh, likens the short-term rentals to hotels. They're not hotels. Hotels can have a limited number of rooms converted. Homeowners who rent live in their homes and they love their mid-century or otherwise homes. And they may not want to make the financial investment, which could be in the thousands, or the change in aesthetics of their, of their uh, house. Thank you, sir. Your time's up. Okay. I'm just going to say that one of the solutions could be offering financial incentives to people. Reduce the permits for people who w will voluntarily make their homes uh, compliant. Good evening, staff, members of the council, Mayor David Feltman, uh, Palm Springs. Uh, I had the opportunity to read this report a couple of times, and I think it's, you know, got some, the, the, the work group did a lot of work, um, and there's a lot of discussion about moving the checkers around on the checkerboard, but the report is missing two fundamentally important analyses, and I know there are members on the dais who care about data and analysis. There is absolutely zero analysis of economic impact by credentialed ec economists, analysts, and people in academia, or academia. 
there is no fiscal impact analysis. We can't have policy where we throw a number up against the wall and say, we move these checkers around and it's going to be great for the community. You guys have a fiduciary responsibility to ensure the fiscal health of our community, that we are able to maintain our bond ratings, that the people who have accumulated uh, wealth in their homes will have that for their futures. But we're just going to throw these numbers out there and see how they stick without any real credentialed analysis on fiscal and economic impact. What I would urge you to do is to thank the committee very much for their work and to take this back to the council and do the work that you guys need to do to ensure that your fiduciary responsibility to us, the citizens, taxpayers, and homeowners is met. Thank you. Please keep uh, the applause down. Thank you. Hello, I'm going to be speaking about uh, item 3A. Uh, my name is Keith Roof. I'm a full-time resident of Palm Springs. Um, I'm also a property manager and concierge for several short-term rental homes in Racket Club Estates and in Vista Las Palmas. I'm in these neighborhoods daily. I interact with neighbors, homeowners, residents in the area. The overwhelming majority of these people are fully supportive of short-term rentals in their neighborhoods. You know, there's a handful of very vocal people that like to uh, fight against it, but the overwhelming majority of people are in support of this. There's been a discussion about density in neighborhoods, so I'd like to discuss that in terms of each neighborhood is unique and has its own unique demographics that affect it. Um, I know our neighbors like to talk about Vista Las Palmas, uh, and I think that's a very good example. Vista Las Palmas is 60% second homes, or vacant homes as is defined by the census. Um, the ability of the uh, density of short-term rentals in the neighborhood is higher because of this factor. So Vista Las Palmas will probably have a higher percentage of vacation rentals than the citywide average due to second homes. As well, when you look at Vista Las Palmas, in 2017, when the ordinance came into effect, there were 70 permits. Today, there are 69 permits. There's no, been no huge increase or rush or spike in the number of permits or rental houses in the neighborhood. So based on the percentage of vacant homes and the stability of short-term rentals in that neighborhood, it really shows that there's not a problem of density in Vista Las Palmas, even though it sits at 16.5%. So I think when you look at the issue of putting a blanket approach to neighborhood density at some random percentage of 10 or 20 percent, it's really not fair and doesn't speak to each individual neighborhood. Um, and if appropriate, I think that if you want to go ahead and implement citywide caps, that's something to discuss and certainly fair. But I think taking that vote, putting that into effect for a few years and kind of see how things play out is the more prudent approach. So at this time, I'd ask that you take a more conservative approach and vote to do citywide caps, but not bring it down to the neighborhood level. Thank you. Brad Anderson, followed by Jim Gazan and David Rios. I thought it was Brad Anderson. Brad Anderson, are you here still? I think he may have stepped out. All right, thank you. Jim, please. Good evening, Council and Mayor Middleton. I'm Jim Gazan, and I'm addressing you regarding item 3A. Glad there's a very fired up crowd here tonight. Uh, I was honored to be invited to the SDR committee as an alternate. And I first really want to acknowledge city staff for the hours spent moderating our meetings and all the hard work that they did behind the scenes uh, preparing reports for all of us. So thank you to that team. From our committee, you are presented a compromise. Some members entered the committee 
wanting no vacation rentals, period, to others that are in the industry and would like very little limitation. I feel our recommendation, which is more than some would like, is fair and retains a robust rental industry while still protecting our community and our neighborhoods. This is not a ban. This consideration tonight is necessary as we've witnessed other desert communities pass moratoriums and outright bans on short-term rentals. Even Idlewild and Temecula has passed a moratorium because of the recent activity and in increased rentals in those communities. It's appropriate to act now. There are two points that I would also like to address that may be discussed or mentioned this evening. Some will say back in 2018, people voted in favor of rentals and that support remains strong today. This is not true. The surge of STRs since COVID is spreading deeper into neighborhoods and it is a contributing factor in higher home prices and residents are changing their minds on this issue. Some will say hotels are in favor of short-term rentals. Well, they might be, but in moderation. Smaller hotels are actually competing with STRs and it's starting to affect their bottom line, especially during slower months. Something else to consider is the fact that STRs have a negative impact on securing financing for new hotel projects by adding thousands of additional beds to our market, which argues moderation. I feel strongly that our group consensus is fair and thoughtful, and I really appreciate your consideration. Thank you. David Rios, followed by Shannon Metcalf and Mario Gonzalez. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm David Rios, and I thank you for this opportunity. I'm an interior designer, and I have been in here designing Palm Springs for the last 10 years. I'm a full-time resident. I'm an agent of 25 years. I sit on a committee of the Board of Realtors here in Palm Springs. I'm a member of the Chamber of Commerce. I'm an owner of a boutique hotel in Las Palmas. I'm a, I volunteer on the nonprofit organization. Um, I also uh, volunteer on the uh, unit. Uh, Palm Springs Unified School District for their homeless committee, uh, Martha's Village fundraisers, and many um, other um, small um, companies and and uh, nonprofit organization. Palm Springs is, in the, is a majority of secondary home market. Um, as, as our market has changed to secondary homes, we'll see a major hit with interest rates raising. And not only that though, the impact that it's doing right now to our, our community. We have, we have teamed up, this is the first time ever that boutique hotels, um, uh, uh, the general population and all the small businesses are thriving. We just got back from two years of, of not making any type of money for our, 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 our um, small businesses. We're now generating tons of money. We're, we're projected to make $25 million in the next year. With $25 million, do you know how much, how, how much resources we can do to, to give it back to um, our, our low-income housing or our homeless shelters? There's so many different alternatives that we can use with $25 million. I'm asking you guys this from the bottom of my heart, at being a business owner, a small business owner, having hotels and understanding everything from the north side, south side, and and uh, the central side of Palm Springs. Please do not kill our industry. We have worked thousands of we have hours and, and, and put tons of money into our city to beautify it. If you want to re uh, address this, do this in the next two years, not when we're, our market and our economy is already crashing. Right now, we're, we're, we're developing a, a hockey team that's going to host 11 to 12 a thousand people nightly. Where are we forcing them off to? And putting a cap right now will only devastate our city and our community. I have been here for over 25 years visiting the city. I dedicate my life to this, to rebuilding the future, and not only that, bringing back the history of Palm Springs. I love this city. I just want you guys to please readdress the concerns that we have here. The TOT, that what it's doing to our community, 2,500 um, houses is, is not enough, and especially the new communities that you guys are passing right now. They're not allowing vacation rentals as well. So pride of ownership is a huge thing. It started with, with, with the north side. You've seen so much crime rate. There's not that much crime rate, rate there now. With, where we see high density areas, they're gorgeous. Please understand our community and what we desperately need. I'm, I'm asking you and begging you as a full-time resident, take in consideration. Thank you, the, Mr. Rios. Thank you, guys. I appreciate this opportunity. Shannon Metcalf. Mario Gonzalez, and Gerald Caton. Hi, I'm Shannon Metcalf, and thank you so much for allowing me to speak. I was actually a part of the work group um, that was discussing these things. 
And one of the first things I wanted to mention, um, the diversity on the group was, it was just absent. I was the only woman. Um, there was a woman who was there uh, the first night, but then um, I think she had other obligations, and so they replaced her but with another, another uh, older white male. And I just think, as far as the optics are concerned, that we need to be looking at these things and make sure that we're talking to people of color in this city, that we're talking to people that are younger and that have families, because I'd really liked, would have liked to have had their input. Um, so as far as the recommendations, uh, and also you should know that I, I own a, a boutique uh, co-hosting business here in Palm Springs. Um, I started my business uh, you know, with my own vacation rental, have since sold my vacation rental to have my own primary home. It was the step that I needed to take in order to have my own, my own home. Um, but as far as the 2,500 citywide cap, um, it seems to me that it would be basically a moratorium right now. Uh, we have 20, almost 2,500 right now. There are something like 200 in the hopper. So it would probably take a year or two in order for us to actually meet that 2,500. So it would stop vacation rentals right now. Um, and it seems that that's what we were kind of looking to do is to slow down and address this density problem. Um, neighborhood caps on top of this seem redundant to me. Um, it seems that these neighborhoods are the way that they are. It's kind of the, they're naturally moving in that direction. Um, I, I was looking at um, some of the brochures, even for Racket Club, when it was they were first being sold. They were being sold as vacation homes. They weren't being sold as primary homes. So they have kind of a natural um, basis of being this. Um, the other thing we wanted to talk about is that the 10% 10, 10 neighborhood caps, um, it would, we'd have 800 permits that would be redistributed throughout the city. Other neighborhood. It's like we're your time is up. Sure. <laughs> Mario Gonzalez, followed by Gerald Caton and Oscar Flink. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, City Council members and staff. My name is Mario Gonzalez, 30875 Date Palm Drive, Cathedral City. I'm a resident of Coachella Valley and a business owner for the past 40 years. I'd like to speak in support of Parklet Program, Item 2B. COVID-19 and its variants has put all, all of us in a situation to rethink how people engage with local business. All over our country, parklets are popping up and proven to be very, very successful. The question is how we continue to build upon the success, the benefits, and the sustainability of parklets for years to come, specifically for our neighborhood restaurants who are the backbone of our community, who have invested and properly managed their individual parklet spaces. As did the City Council judiciously respond and act in August of 2020, allowing land use permits for parklets and public right-of-ways with design guidelines. And because of your actions and forward thinking, we are here before you this evening. More importantly, it's a fact that parklets are a great option for folks who remain hesitant to dining indoors. This is a way for local businesses can accommodate them, and more importantly, is proven that parklets encourage social distancing. Even though studies show that people are drawn to other people, people, the fact is that people want to be with people. They feel safer when there are more eyes on the street. When you create spaces in front of your own business that improves the quality of life, you get to control how these spaces are managed. And anyone who comes into your neighborhood to support your business is also supporting the local economy. The nine parklets are natural addition to the fabric of Palm Canyon Drive. They elevate the dining experience. They create energy. They are safe and they are fun. And they foster what is this great city is all about, fun in the sun. Being outdoors, dining outdoors. Alfresco kitchens have been around for decades. In closing, I pray this council continues with the great program and it becomes a zoning ordinance in perpetuity. Myself and my son, Alex Gonzalez, are the owners of El Patron Crafted Tacos and Drinks, located at 101 South Palm Canyon Drive. Thank you, sir. Your time is up. Gerald, Kate, Gerald Caton, followed by Oscar Flink. You know what, I think everybody has said exactly what I was going to say over the last 20 minutes, so I will take your advice. Thank you. 
Gerald Caton, followed by Brad Anderson, if he's present. Oh, I'm sorry, Oscar Flink. Good evening, Council. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Palm Springs. Uh, my name is Oscar Flink. I manage vacation rentals for a living. I've been here for a few years and I've enjoyed every day of my lifestyle in Palm Springs, which is what we sell to travelers. A beautiful lifestyle, beautiful homes that are maintained by homeowners who invest in their properties. If it ain't broken, don't fix it. What is the sense of urgency with doing this today or next month? Did anything major happen in the city with vacation rentals? No, it's a natural growth because more travelers are coming every year. Residents have a 24 seven hotline paid by vacation rental owners that works very well. You hear music, you call the city, someone's there within minutes. The bad, uh, the bad actors are getting banned, the party houses are getting banned, so we have a working system for everyone. A lot of homes are always secondary homes. This change means the city prefers them to be empty rather than enjoyed by people who are willing to pay and travel to Palm Springs to enjoy your beautiful lifestyle. And I wanted to also mention something. Someone mentioned the interest of the hotel industry having trouble filling their rooms in the summer. Why should that come at the cost of property owners? People have the choice whether they prefer a vacation rental or a hotel. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for listening. Madam Mayor, if you'll give us just a moment, we'll move to phone comments. Kathy Warmick, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Uh, thank you, Mayor Middleton, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Gardner, members of the Council, friends. Uh, I'm talking today on the, the vacation rental issue, and I just wanted to raise something that really stood out to me when I got to read both the city reports and the reports um, from VRON, and that is that we have seven, either 8,709 or 7,700, 7, uh, excuse me, is there, there's noise in the background? Can Thank you. Uh, we have we have that many residences that are not in norgs. That's 22 percent of our housing stock, and they are scattered all over the city. I don't know how. You know, I had assumed back in 2019 that every every residence in the city was going to be included in a norg. It's how we communicate with our residents. But how can you base a, a vacation rental change on a neighborhood standard when you when you have very few vacation rentals in the the areas that aren't norgs they're scattered all, all over the city and it would be really easy to put all of the vacation rentals in one little area um, I I was absolutely shocked by that and I don't think it's workable um, to, to base this on neighborhoods when we've got such a large area that's not organized. Uh, the other concern I had is I didn't really understand in the city report, in the, the task force report, how they came to 10%. There was no, no real explanation of the work they'd done. And when I look at the 10%, it means that the the newer home, the newer vacation rentals that come in will go into the neighborhoods with very few vacation rentals, but those also turn out to be our poorest neighborhoods. And Thank you, Kathy. Really your time's up. Housing. Thank you. Michael Elsinas, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, City Council, for providing me with a couple of minutes to talk. I'm certainly very thoughtfully convening the SDR work group. Also, thanks to the work group for their extensive and insightful recommendations, which I wholeheartedly support. Um, I'm a data-driven geek, and I'm really impressed with the data that was presented. Uh, as a resident of an Indian Canyon's neighborhood with a high concentration of SDRs, 
one directly adjacent to another, and another whose spa is 50 feet from my primary bedroom. Uh, during high season weekends, it's disconcerting to live in a Motel 6 environment rather than the high-end residential setting I had hoped and paid for. Uh, I have availed myself, however, of the vacation rental hotline several times, and I'm quite pleased to say that it works. However, I object to being responsible for an STR owner's inability to properly manage their properties, nor do I feel that it's my responsibility to contact the owner first. Rarely a resolution occurs, especially at 2 o'clock a.m., Fines and license revocations, unfortunately, work best. The next point posed as a question, but more of a statement, as I don't expect an answer. Given counsel person Holstage's husband's business to avoid conflict of interest, should she not recuse herself or abstain from votes or for any counsel activity that focus on STRs? Uh, thank you again very much for all your hard work. Thank you. Andrew Wallace, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Good evening. This is in regards to item 3A. I purchased my house in Sunrise Park in April of 2021 and applied for a permit on March 7th, 2022. I was issued a permit while the plans are in review. This is a second house that my in-laws and my wife and I bought so we could enjoy the amazing town of Palm Springs with the three children under six who really just want to be in the pool all day, every day. Part of that plan, which was integral to us being able to afford the house, was able, being able to short-term rent on the handful of weekends we wouldn't be in Palm Springs. Unfortunately, I've just come to find out that our plan is now teetering on the edge of viability. Having spent many years as tourists in Palm Springs, we debated for a long time how we wanted to become a more permanent part of the community. We finally decided to buy a house that was falling apart, but in a very nice and respected neighborhood so we could build our dream house. We have spent over a year dealing with builders and the city to get building permit on a house that was derelict and non-compliant with city codes. After months of submitting city staff responses and the resubmittals, we are still without a finalized building permit, let alone being issued a certificate of occupancy, which would then qualify us to apply for the vacation rental permit. Uh, with these new proposed restric restrictions taking place, I'm afraid I will end up at the back of the line waiting many years for a permit, all due to the natural timing of my project. That said, I'm in a unique predicament which has not been addressed in the study, and I hope there will be some expectations carved out for a handful of people like myself. I am trying to help the community while not being forced to sell because we can't subsidize our home. We are not a large investment company. We're a family who put a tremendous amount of our savings on the line so we could have our dream in Palm Springs. I hope we aren't turned upside down because permitting took the year or we didn't buy our house a few months earlier, not, never knowing that these restrictions would happen at the beginning of construction. Please keep in mind that broad restrictions like these will have a harmful effect on small homeowners like me and my family. What mechanism is the city council proposing to protect those of us that made investments and plans prior to any public announcement of these potential new requirements? Thank you for donating your time to the city of Palm Springs. Jim Franklin, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, City staff, and all of you in the room, uh, my name is Jim Franklin. I'm the president of the Greater Palm Springs Realtor Association. I'm here to talk on 3A. Um, but I kind of, David Feltman pretty much covered what I was going to talk about, but I did um, send the council an email today. And one of the things was uh, that I discussed was you know, unintended consequences that happen when you change laws and make changes like this. And I would suggest we go back to the drawing board um, and think this through before fixing something that is working. And on a final note, I'd like to know, I don't expect an answer on this, but why someone from our association, because we're the realtors, we're the first ones on the front line. And I know that Karen DeBaugh applied for that. I was unable to apply for it because I was going to be out of town and unavailable, but I would like to redo this and, and make sure we have a spokesperson from our association. Thank you very much and have a good night. Chris Bale, you're, Chris Bale, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. 
Greetings, council and mayors and vacation rental work group. This is regarding item 3A. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm an 11-year-old resident and look. I was only able to begin what the work group came up with for recommendation, but I do have some important thoughts. Um, if each neighborhood is limited to the 10% as far as is recommended, it seems to me that this will force upcoming up and coming neighborhoods will end up attracting the investors that want these STRs. And so these are probably less expensive neighborhoods. They will eventually gentrify and raise prices in those neighborhoods, which is not a long term plan for affordable rent. The city might want to channel its efforts into a joint effort with DHS and Cathedral to create more apartment opportunities for service industry workers and other people that need affordable housing. Trying to push back down the prices is not something that's going to be easily done, even as we might be going into a recession. Like it or not, Palm Springs become a city like Laguna Beach and Santa Barbara, where prices are up because it's a nice place to live and people want to be here. It's not a time to take advantage of that when people who already are here and that are in the process of buying, thinking they're going to be getting a vacation rental, that might be affected by these sudden rules changing and not know if they're going to be able to get the vacation rental in a formerly vacation rental friendly town. I get that we can't have every house in this town be vacation rental, but I do hear complaints from some of my clients, usually from people that feel like every house in their neighborhood is vacant, but the hotline is a place and it does work when there are complaints. So I think the vacation rentals that are in this town are managed to benefit of everything because of the TOT bringing money into the town. I think it's a lot more forward thinking about working with our neighboring cities as a group or the Tela Valley and look at the planning um, of the remaining open land that's in Palm Springs and consider more high density, affordable, and I use the word affordable in quotes, housing because different cities have different levels of affordability. Thank you, Chris. Your time's up. <laughs> Ashley Vuz, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. Awesome. Hey, City Council. Is Ashley, 32 years old, I'm a proud buyer in the city of Palm. I'm sorry, Ashley, you have a bad connection. Can you, we'll give you a call back in just a moment, okay? Oh, okay, copy. All right, um, so my name is Ashley Ryan. I am 32. I'm a proud transgender, first time home buyer in the city of Palm Springs. I'm here to uh, make a comment on the uh, vacation rental cap. And um, I just wanted to say that when I bought my house in Palm Springs, I uh, pulled my money together with my best friend, like any millennial would do. And we decided to buy a house here uh, because of the fact that we had the option to do um, a vacation rental um, if we wanted to, rather than um, buy in any other city in the desert that has tight restrictions. And so because of that, we ended up buying in Palm Springs. Um, and while we didn't end up using that option, it was still the reason we purchased in Palm Springs. And since then, during the pandemic, we really enjoyed remodeling our house so much that we started a small um, home flipping business. Um, we're on our second and third project right now. And we're really worried that creating a cap on this would affect our bottom line. As many of the buyers who are very quick buyers um, making the good offers um, are people who are using the houses for vacation rental. And not only would this squash my dream, I would like to also speak up for all the other people in my age range in 20 or 30 years old who may be coming to Palm Springs to do their first flip um, to do their first vacation rental or get their first home with their friends. Um, this uh, creating a cap on it would prevent all those people um, from fulfilling their dreams by creating, uh, making it harder for them um, to get on a wait list and possibly have to wait a year before turning it into a vacation rental. Uh, they do not have the resources for that. Um, so anyways, I would say don't ban business by creating a cap. Create more business by building more houses. That way everyone wins.
that's all I have to say. Thank you. Jerome Mickelson, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Hi, my name is Jerome Mickelson. I'm going to comment about uh, item 3A, the cap on a short-term license. I wanted to start by um, just concurring with previous comments regarding the fiscal analysis that should be done to see what the overall will be on any type of cap on approach rental licenses in the city of Palm Springs. Uh, I've been a part-time resident of Palm Springs for a little over two years. I've lived in two different neighborhoods, Decker Park Estates and Little Tuscany. Um, while staying in Palm Springs, I haven't had any issues with any of the short-term um, vacation rental in my neighborhoods. Uh, I've never had to call the hotline, although I know it was available to me if were issues. Um, so I really feel that there, this is being brought up. Uh, the, the cap, there's not really, there's a few people complaining about it, but overall, I don't see what the big issue is in Palm Spring. I don't see any type of analysis and reports on complaints going up or any impacts um, aside from a few people who are unhappy with uh, some of the vacation rentals. Um, we have great rules that are in place. They're very strict, and I think that they're, for me, they're working. For my neighborhood, they're working. Uh, lastly, I think that this should be something that voted on by the residents of Palm Springs. This should be put up to a vote. Um, but again, this should be after a fiscal analysis study is done um, on the impact. Thank you for your time. Alex Nasiri, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Hi, my name is Dr. Alex Nasiri. I'm a, a full-time resident of Palm Springs and a local physician here. I just want to say thank you, Madam Mayor and City Council, for giving me the opportunity to briefly bring up um, a quick point um, in regard to this short-term rentals. Uh, I just wanted to say that I do support the work group's uh, findings. I think that some limits are in well overdue. I would like to add, to, and if someone, I don't know if anyone's brought this up, if there could be a waiting period place, one or two year waiting period place, so that when a permit expires, that house goes to the back of the queue and cannot automatically renew a permit. This allows for more to, it, it, it kind of prevents a pre prejudicial situation where certain homes are now granted permits and then that house maintains a permit long term. It allows different homeowners to put their homes into the short term rental market without oversaturating it, keeping it at the 10% cap, but allowing for different homes to come into the market rather than just one house having an exclusive right to in that in that neighborhood long term i think it's really important to prevent a prejudicial issue occurring like that and fiscally it's really important to prevent a recapitulation of what happened in 2008's housing crisis because we really want to demonstrate by having a waiting period we demonstrate that the homeowners who are putting these houses on short on for short-term rental they are solvent that meaning that they are not dependent strictly on income brought in to pay the mortgage. Otherwise, we're creating another quasi subprime zero kind of situation that created a, a really bad situation in 08 for those of us who were here and remember it. Um, we have to be really careful. What if the state or the county comes in overnight, says bans all short term rentals because of the state housing crisis? Are we all of a sudden going to be? having all these homes go into bankruptcy because these people who wanted to run hotels out of their homes, like we had Thank you, Dr. Nasiri, your time is up. <laughs> James Galt, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. Thank you so much. Hi, Mayor and Council Members. My name is James Galt. I'm a full-time resident of the Coachella Valley since 2017. As I understand it, two of the driving concerns of Palm Springs residents and subsequently the City Council regarding the continued expansion of the short-term rental industry in our incredible city 
our housing affordability, and the comfort and quality of life of our residents. I've worked in real estate full-time since moving to Palm Springs, mostly in sales, but also in management. As of August of 2022, the average cost for a single-family detached home in our city is $1,366,467. Unfortunately, in my view, without any assistance from the short-term rental industry, we have moved way past the point of first time and minority home buyers being able to purchase homes in Palm Springs. Perhaps the council should look at working to create state-funded financial incentives for local and national builders to increase production of affordable single-family housing in more land-available areas of the valley. Doing this rather than penalizing both full and part-time residents of Palm Springs who've worked investing their own wealth to make our city's residences a desirable place to live and to visit. Regarding quality of life for residents, as those preceding me have stated, the voice of the people of the city has been heard loudly in support of vacation rentals with two votes and across many platforms. I own multiple homes in Palm Springs. One is a current short-term rental and one is not, as do many, many of my clients and friends. I know some members of the committee work as activists on behalf of our Valley's minority communities. And to that, I would ask the committee and the study, did it take the time to consider the number of individuals within our Valley's minority communities who rely on employment by the short-term rental management companies and short-term rental owners, and also rely heavily on income created by the short-term rental industry for their primary income? Having worked in management of short-term rentals as well as real estate as a whole, the majority of complaints against short-term rentals as homes and an industry come from white, part-time, seasonal residents. It seems to me that for the sake of optics, the council is considering, without the necessary due diligence, conceding the success and growth of our city's most primary industry and the livelihood of many of its full-time residents, minority or otherwise, to the voice of this overtly outspoken view. Thank you, James. Thank you. Your time is up. Madam Mayor, that concludes our list. And for the record, we were unable to reach one speaker, Bruce Hoban. So the next item uh, is the consent calendar. I will entertain a motion uh, to accept the consent calendar uh, as presented to us. Uh, is there a motion? Motion to accept. Second. I'll second. Uh, roll call, please. We lost. <laughs> We're down to three, but we can yeah, still vote. Yes. We don't have a quorum right now, so we need to wait for Council Member Woods. All right. Has Council Member Holstage come online? Three. All right. Three's Can a quorum. We... Well, no. we do have a quorum, actually. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> uh, since we don't have Council Member Holstage present, we can't use the button. So, oh, got it. Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Council Member Course. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion carries 3 0. All right. We will move on. Councilmember Woods, do you want to uh, vote on the consent calendar? Well, there's no objection. Okay, then please. Do you have that, Madam Clerk? I so noted. All right, thank you. Next item is 2A, a public hearing to consider an application by Carlos uh, Serrana and Monica May, owners for historic designation of the Robson Chambers residence located at 695 South Warm Sands Drive. May we have staff report, please? Uh, Madam Mayor and members of council, good evening. Uh, this first public hearing is related to the historic designation of the Robson Chambers residence. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. 
The residence is located in Warm Sands Park. It was designed by renowned architect Robson Chambers as the personal home for he and his wife, Helen. The home was originally constructed in 1946 and was designed to be expanded to accommodate the growing needs of his family, which it was twice, first in 1950 and again in 1956. For those who don't know, Mr. Chambers was a local architect who originally located in Palm Springs to work with another renowned architect, Albert Frey. Together, they are considered to have contributed significantly to the desert modern architectural style, which his residence is an early example of. Mr. Chambers was also a contributor to the design of our own city hall and went on to become the campus architect for the University of California, Santa Barbara uh, from 1966 until 1982, where you can see the influence of his later work. Here on the left, you can see what is unfortunately a, a not so clear picture of the original plan that was developed in 1946, showing a two bedroom, one bathroom home. Chambers carefully considered the desert climate and views in every aspect of his design, and as he also intended for the home to be expanded, as he and his wife Helen grew their family, created a design that would allow for easy expansion of the home. The image on the right shows the result of two expansions that would happen in 1950 and 1956, as I mentioned, uh, that would add a primary bedroom and carport, among other improvements. Here we can see some photographs, uh, historic photographs of the property as it was used by the family uh, in the 15 years that they lived there. And here we have photographs of the residence today, demonstrating the residence's exemplification of the desert modern architectural style. In terms of the criteria for consideration of historic designation of the property, the Historic Preservation Board found that the property met four of the criteria necessary for designation. And they are listed here on this slide. In addition, they also reviewed the residence for integrity and found that the residence does merit designation as a class one or landmark structure, and they voted unanimously to recommend approval. That concludes my presentation to you, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Um, I do believe that we have the current owners and applicants, Ms. May and Mr. Serrano on Zoom, as well as Mr. Vaught, who authored the nomination report. Um, so they're available for the public hearing section, and I'm also available for any questions. Thank, Thank you. you. At this time, uh, are there any questions for staff? Probably met four of the criteria necessary for designation, and they are listed here. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff? I see none, all right. Uh, at this time, I would like to open the public hearing. The public is invited to speak on this public hearing item for up to two minutes. Madam Mayor, we have no registered speakers, uh, but as Mr. Hadwin stated, the applicants are available on Zoom. All right, thank you. Uh, the public hearing is now closed. Is there any uh, additional discussion or questions from council? Do we have a motion? I can't. Uh... Oh, is it because? Um, yeah. We're... Yeah. So, um, so moved. Staff recommendation based on the criteria listed in the staff report and the gorgeous house. <laughs> Is, is there a second? Second. All right. Is there any further discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Council Member Kors? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Yes. Council Member Woods? Yes. Mayor Middleton? Yes. Motion carries 4 0. All right. Thank you. Congratulations. Next portion of our meeting is set aside to discuss business and legislative items. Item 3A is a review and discussion of the vacation rental work group recommendations. May we have a staff report, please? Good evening, Council. Tonight, um, we return to you with the recommendation of the Vacation Rental Work Group. I'd like to point out that this is simply a recommendation. There is no voting to place this cap or to place this density. In fact, Council um, is here to provide direction to staff for what they'd like us to do next in getting ready to draft ordinance revisions. Um, I'd also like to point out that um, there was public comment received entitled as a um, supplemental comment and data to the 
vocational rental work group recommendation. This document was not reviewed or vetted by the work group. Rather, it was submitted by an independent stakeholder group that is a proponent of vacation rentals. So we just wanted to clarify that that document was not part of our official um, recommendation that we prepared. Um, Veronica, I could I introduce, could I, sorry, can I interrupt yes. you just a moment? Um, I own a um, home share, which is, and this is to the city attorney, which means I own a home, uh, not a separate casita, that, and I rent out a room, and I have to get a permit for that from the city. And I believe that would preclude me from this discussion this evening, to recuse myself. Um, Unless we uh, bifurcated the discussion between uh, home shares and traditional vacation rentals, uh, I agree. That, that is an option if the council is interested in, in bifurcating the conversation. If that's the case, if the council wishes to do that, then it would be appropriate to hear the, the staff report uh, and then uh, hear the um, conversation about uh, home shares first, uh, where um, Council Member Woods could step out and then uh, he would be able to come, come back for the conversation on vacation rentals. So it's up to the council. Council member, uh, course. Sure, um, I would ask that we bifurcate. I think there's nothing the council have asked for related to home shares, nothing in the working group report on home shares. And given leaving three of us, um, we need unanimity, I think, um, and council member uh, Wood's um, significant planning and other experience, I think having him here would be a benefit if that's okay with council member Woods and the rest of council. Uh, I don't mind that whatsoever. I, I just in no way want to compromise uh, this very important discussion to the community in any way, shape, or form. And I know that some of the, I don't know if the density that's recommended in the staff report would include home shares or not, but if it got into that discussion, um, that would be, a, you know, I just, again, I want to be very safe with this and not compromise it in any way. So I'll leave that to the city attorney. If we start going into that discussion, I'll certainly remind the council about that. All right, thank you. So moving forward, we will rely on the city attorney to advise us that uh, council member Woods would need to step aside. Thank you. Um, I'd like to also um, thank our 11 member work group for their hard work and dedication. The subject of vacation rentals is contentious is a difficult one. Um, it was a very, um, there were some meetings that we did have a lot of discussion um, and it, no, there were times that we were not all in agreement. So it was a very difficult um, process, but we got through it and at the end, the way we presented to you was a majority consensus, not unanimous vote, but majority consensus. Um, so we will get into this at this time then. Um, the vacation re rental work group was selected at the direction of staff following our study session. Um, we had a public application process with a total of 124 applications received. Um, there were three members of the work group that city staff recommended and the eight were randomly selected using a program um, on Excel that generated the additional eight names. Um, a total of five meetings were conducted. Um, with regard to the makeup of the group, we had a total of two members identifying as opposed to vacation rentals, two as proponents, um, I'm sorry, four who were um, proponents and the remaining as neutral. We did have two on our applications that identified themselves as a real estate background. Um, because we did not have specific direction at the time of selecting the group to choose someone from the real estate um, board, we did not. Um, however, like I said, we are receiving further direction, so would be happy to entertain further meetings if that is what um, council would like. Um, the work group process, the goal of our group was to um, represent the interest in the issue and create a balanced recommendation that was acceptable to all work group members. Uh, work group members were advised of our rules of engagement, which identified our ground rules for effective and respectful communication um, and to advise them how we'd be making decisions. The decisions was, as stated, majority consensus, meaning that um, we did not have 100% agreement on all of the topics. In fact, we took several votes um, throughout our five group meetings and it was whatever side had more votes. So it wasn't by a percentage, it was simply who had more. So there were votes that were very close and I did want to point that out. But that just stresses how um, contentious and controversial this topic is. Um, the mission of the work group 
um, was to form this recommendation for future policy considerations. So we knew coming tonight that no decisions would be made. These were simply recommendations for council to consider in advising staff on how to proceed. We reviewed three topics, vacation rental density, vacation rentals as an ancillary use or secondary use of one's home and the impacts on housing supply. We did not review any economic impacts to the city and believe that would be best suited by um, professionals who, do, who can provide better information to the city as those who don't have all the information available to them to do that. Um, with regard to the recommendations made by the city, um, made by the council's I'm sorry, made by the work group to council is a 2,500 citywide vacational rental cap with the stipulation that all submitted permit applications will be processed, as well as applications for properties that have an escrow closing date within 30 days of the adopted ordinance, as well as a 10% cap a 10% neighborhood cap. The 2,500 cap was selected because the group thought it was, um, as majority consensus, thought it was best to set the cap where we currently are or close to being um, with our current vacation rental population. They also stated that it's easier to add additional permits than take away. So that's why that number was chosen as well. We reviewed different permit uh, trends and saw the numbers and we felt that 2,500 um, was a good starting point, again, with the ability to add at a later date, review at a later date if that was needed to. Um, again, the citywide, this was a um, contentious item as well. Um, it was, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of votes, and at various times during our sessions, we discussed issues of density, overall numbers in the units in the community. We looked at various data sources that were reviewed by the group. There were numerous data sources reviewed. We did not attach all of the material report due to how voluminous they were. We felt attaching the items that were used in making the determinations for these recommendations were most important. Um, however, we can make those additional items available to the public on our website for review. The group unanimously did agree that a vacation rental cap was needed. So everyone in the group, this was the only vote we had that we had a unanimous decision on. The group voted that the number um, of citywide permits twice and 2,500 again was the number that was reached by majority consensus. Um, the most difficult topic and one that we actually did not even come to a recommendation um, until the second to last meeting was the neighborhood cap. The group addressed oversaturation of vacation rentals throughout the city with specific concerns, including the loss of residential community and neighborhoods with the high percentage of vacation rental properties, the number of second homes not utilized as vacation rentals that just sit vacant, impacts of vacation rentals to local housing stock, and the impact of restrictions on the tourism industry. Percentages rescinded to the group for review for discussion ranged from 6% to 20%. Um, and as stated, it was not until August 30th that we reached the majority consensus of 10%. So that, again, was a very difficult number to reach. And there were different items that we looked at. Um, staff took data from our vacation rental program, applied it to our neighborhood counts, and were able to calculate a current density. We provided scenarios of impact of each of those neighborhoods in those ranges for the group to review. The group understood that low, um, any lowering of caps below 10% would be unrealistic to um, would be unrealistic just due to the current numbers. A common comment um, with the group um, was just the difficulty it was to determine a number. Um, we actually, as staff, did view other city council meetings um, that had percentage caps to see how they reached that number. There was no formula used. There was no. Um, specific you know, program that they put anything into to determine a number. It was basically just based on discussion of council and public comment. So there's no rhyme or reason. And I think that's why we really struggled with that neighborhood cap number. Um, with regard to the discussion of vacation rental density, secondary and ancillary use, the group reviewed data on contract summary submissions and the ordinance 19 conditions, covenants, restrictions, and contract limits. Majority consensus agreed that the city's regulations for limiting contract summaries, barring corporate ownership and limiting financial interest in vacation rental ownership um, were sufficient in regulating this. Uh, majority consensus determined that no recommendation would be made on this topic. So one question is you yes. talk about majority consensus on the last item and this. Can you on some things you have the vote 
in the report, and some things it doesn't say what the vote was. So it would be helpful. Is it 10 to 1 is different than 6 to 5, let's say? Correct. So, so we outlined the ones that we had that were the, the most contentious votes. Um, those were the ones that we outlined the actual voting numbers. We can make those numbers available and add them to the additional data um, as we, that we provide. So like on this one, do you, do you remember what the vote was? If you don't, that's fine. Or on, on the on the density, the 10 percent neighborhood. Yes. Yeah, so on the 10 percent neighborhood cap, we had um, members missing. So the vote um, was um, six to three for six to three for the uh, for the neighborhood cap of 10 percent. And we okay. voted twice. We actually voted once for 10% and once for 20%, and it simply just flip flops. So when we voted for 20%, it was the opposite vote. Okay, and for that, there's, an, there's the current system is enough to ensure that they're, only, they're used as secondary use for the homes. Do you remember what the vote was on that? If you don't, you can tell me later. I do not recall, okay. but I will provide that okay, to you. Thanks. Um, the impacts to housing, again, was um, a difficult discussion where we came back several times with additional information. Um, the work group did consider vocational rental properties that would um, that could be otherwise used for uh, long-term tenants or residents, um, if available. Um, they also pointed out that Palm Spring needs the construction of more affordable housing, including multifamily residences. And the group agreed that the need to maintain vacation rentals as secondary and ancillary use uh, with continued strict enforcement of the ordinance was definitely needed to help with this. Um, there was the recommendation of the 2,500 cap and 10% neighborhood cap uh, would assist with the housing impact. So there no further recommendation was made on that housing to impact. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce Patrick Clifford. He's going to go over the data that we used in reaching the, these decisions and explain how, um, how the group reviewed them. Thank you. Yes, good evening, Madam Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem, council members, uh, public joining us this evening. Um, you know, Veronica did a great job kind of going over the overview of all the data that was used in our uh, work group. Um, with the report that we did submit to council, though, there was attachments, so I just really wanted to give kind of a brief overview of what, what the work group did look at, and then uh, be happy to answer any questions pertaining to that. So what we learned at our first meeting on 719 was and between our second meeting on 819 is there was a really challenge of trying to find out what our actual household count was here in Palm Springs. Uh, we reviewed census data, GIS data, and even looked at our housing element survey. Uh, with, with that material um, on our second meeting, we did provide the housing element survey information to our vacation rental group, and that was what was used as a, a foundation um, for our Palm Springs uh, household count. Um, additionally, there was additional material submitted to the council um, where it focused on criteria such as a 10% um, neighborhood cap. Um, this data was similar to the information shared with our work group. Uh, it's just formatted a little differently for ease of understanding and goes into a different explanation of the impacts with those defined percentages. The group has provided a spreadsheet that illustrated Palm Springs neighborhoods, household counts, vacation rental counts from our latest count was in July, 20, July 28, 2022, and what this percentage was um, to the household counts. This was followed by a percentage cap scenarios between 3 and 20 percent, and what number of VR, VRs per neighborhood uh, would be based off of that percentage. Yeah, of course. Go ahead. Uh, can you explain this chart a little better? Mm -hmm. um, like, as an example, you have, uh, go to the, the slide you just got rid of. Um, you have uh, Palm Springs Villas 2. And um, are you doing that? I, I'm curious why that's there when everything else, or, or Four Seasons when the other stuff is neighborhoods. I'm not understanding, because it says neighborhood, but that's not a neighborhood. So I'm very confused. Yeah, so uh, the information we used was from our GIS layer um, that's in our mapping software, and it had that identified as a neighborhood as far as the layer. So when we did the population counts as mm -hmm. far as the households that were given to us, that was labeled um, Four yeah. Seasons yeah. or Palm Springs VS2. 
Just so you, yeah, Dennis, um, sorry, Councilmember Woods, uh, Four Seasons is its own neighborhood group, and Palm Springs Villas, too, was just recently made it's, its oh, own it's neighborhood Scott's group. Yeah. Okay, th thank you yeah. very much on that. And then the households, uh, when you say the households, that includes condominiums and apartments? Uh, yes, from my understanding, from that data that we received from um, our GIS um, experts, I think it was back in the spring, um, I can't recall if it didn't did or did include apartments, but it did, should include the uh, condominiums in that respective neighborhood, I believe. But I'm not sure about apartments. So the first, the how's the first thing? Thank you for taking the time here. We have um, basically, we don't know if it's apartments or not, but we have 35,721 um, units in the city of Palm Springs. Okay, great. With a population of, I think, 46 or 47,000. That, am I understanding that correctly? As far as the population, I can't answer on, but going to that 35,721, so that is the number from our housing element survey, survey that focuses on single family dwellings and um, condominiums only. That number there does exclude apartments. Um, the household data that's in the row, um, in the second column, for example, Canyon Corridor, it says 1,063. I'm uncertain if that data that was provided to me does show apartments in that um, calculation. But the 35,721 is, is a number from our housing element survey that strictly says, um, you know, single family. In fact, I have it right there below where um, the last two rows where a single family was 22,210 and condominiums wait, was 32,000. Back up just a minute. I'm not following that. Just no, go a little slower. Thanks. Oh, I know. <laughs> I got you. Um, so um, back, I didn't get the last two numbers. I don't see them on the chart. That's what I'm trying to understand. Oh, yes. I don't know if this is Oh, those two. Got it. Single family and condo. Okay. Yep. So yeah. we actually have, for people to live in, we have a lot of apartments, right? So we actually have more than 35,000 units uh, in the city of Palm Springs. Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah. If we, you know, since that housing survey element um, did not, those numbers right there does not include apartments, I would agree with that. Okay, great. Thank apartments. you. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you. No, that's okay. Just Thank you. Just one follow-up. One follow-up. Okay. Do we know how many apartment units we have in the city? I know we asked for that back in March, so. I definitely can look at the survey, what that was. Um, I don't recall it off my head, but I can get that. Okay. And then for the ones that have zeros um, at the bottom, are those HOAs? They all look like HOAs that don't allow vacation rentals, right? Correct. I so know those couldn't be even if they wanted to. Correct. I know four okay. seasons. Um, definitely, I know Asina has an HOA rule. There's no short-term rentals. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I just. Can you, Patrick, can you just address that for the public that's in the room? Because not every area in our city is covered under a neighborhood organization, right? Yes, that's correct. And if okay. there was a neighborhood that was missing on this uh, chart, it just wasn't on the layer that I received from GIS at that time. Um, so it would be under the NA um, as far as um, if there was a vacation rental in that neighborhood, but the household okay. would be under NA. Thank you. But let me, thank you. Can I just... Go further on that. Sorry. So the thirty-five, the uh, thirty-five seven twenty-one, uh, is only the neighborhoods. It doesn't include those areas that does not have an organized neighborhood. Is that what I'm understanding? No. Oh, yeah. got it. Got it. That is it not what. Thank you. Yeah. That is not what's on the chart. Yes, got it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> back one more. And so the 2,500 cap number that was in majority consensus um, by the group was determined by the current status of vacation rental registrations as Veronica mentioned and the pending new applications um, with the city and our department. And, you know, at that time uh, when our, our meeting started, we were at 2,445 vacation rentals and that's the number that we really based a lot of this um, percentage analysis on. Uh, and at, this, at that time, we were close to 200 pending vacation rental applications in our system, and that still uh, holds true today. Um, technically, as of today, we have 2,503 registered vacation rentals with 235 pending in our system. 
Additional information was given to the group based on questions and additional feedback. Uh, staff um, provided information related to our application volume, um, application trends, uh, condominium information, uh, hotel information um, that staff was able to find. And um, additionally, there was discussion about um, what vacation rentals look like by council district. And those attachments are all also included in the report. Implementing the 2500 uh, cap would set vacation rental permits to the highest um, that I know have known and maintained data since uh, April of 2017. Um, and in fact, once all these applications that we have in the current queue are processed, we'll be a little over 2700. And this chart that's provided in the presentation shows the growth since 2017 to um, the latest figure that we put in was July 2022. And the, the group also was presenting information regarding ancillary use. Um, when the group met to discuss this on August 16, 2022, uh, staff provided the, the current ordinance findings, um, our contract summary information that was discussed in our March um, vacation rental study session, and the staff processes and ordinance requirements with respect to uh, covenants, conditions, and restrictions um, such as CCNRs. And the next two slides you'll see was just information that we presented in our vacation rental study um, back in March. Um, for example, this uh, slide shows that um, owner contract summaries uh, that were submitted to the uh, city during the calendar year 2021, which a median um, per vacation rental was 19. And the same information from our agency operators um, showing that a median uh, contract summary per operator was 20. And just a little background, or if you don't know about the contract summaries, is that uh, a contract summary is required to be submitted by a vacation rental. Um, this is, excludes home shares to the city um, prior to each short-term occupancy. And for the group's housing discussion, uh, the group was provided the following uh, reports. There was a report from Forbes, um, the Airbnb effect on housing and rent. Uh, there was a report uh, provided uh, by a group member from the Economic Policy Institute. Uh, there was also a report uh, provided to the group um, from the Harvard Business Review. And then there was a report um, that staff provided um, from the Milken Institute titled Staying, Staying, Staying Power, the Effects of Short-Term Rentals on California's Tourism, Economy, Econ Economy and Housing Affordability. Additionally, the group was provided data from another group member that shows vacant homes um, not that, that are not considered uh, vacation rentals. Uh, and it was provided as a chart to uh, the group, which uh, really kind of shows uh, not vacation rentals, but these are vac vacant homes that aren't considered um, uh, short-term vacation rentals. And that was also an attachment in the report this evening. And that concludes my overview of the, the additional attachments, and I thank Council for your time. All right, thank you. And we are going to now begin with uh, some questions for staff. I'd like to begin with just one basic overview question. Uh, as I understand it, uh, this is a staff report. Uh, that has come to us and you are asking City Council to provide you direction back to staff that there will, and that is correct, there will be uh, no action that would be taken this evening uh, that would actually result in us taking a vote to do X or to do Y. That would happen when uh, you come back with a ordinance for first reading for us, but we can provide direction to you as to what should be in that ordinance when it comes back. For those, so for those who are thinking, we are going to take precipitous action this evening uh, to put something into law. Is that going to take place? 
No, Mayor Middleton, you are correct. Today right. we're asking for direction. We're sharing with you the recommendations. Right. Any additional direction you have, we then can come incorporate into a draft ordinance. All right. So I'd like to turn to my colleagues for questions. Council Member Kors. Um, thank you, Mayor. Thank you for everyone who um, emailed us and participated in public comment tonight. Uh, regardless of the variety of views, which many are strongly held, I think there are merits to all, merit to all of them. And um, I appreciate all the work staff did and the working group for everything they did. Um, I have a lot of questions, and I won't do comments. I'll do questions. Um, and I think I'm the only one other than Director Fagg who was on staff or on council when we passed the ordinance, although Mayor Middleton was very involved at 1PS um, as well. Um, and please don't take any of my questions to think I'm what I'm thinking because I'm very open-minded. They're really questions from I got from the public and a lot that I had. So one was the last thing I think you touched on, Patrick, which is from the end of the report, which I just noticed when you said that, which said, um, Issues were raised by the group which had not been directed by the city council and the first is ancillary and secondary use. Yet on page two it says city council directed staff and the working group to, to address ancillary use or secondary use, which I remember us doing. So just to clarify for the public, since those are inconsistent in different parts of the staff report, that it was something council did want looked into. Um, and that's at the beginning. But I just want to clarify because when you said at the end I said, Okay, but it was in the beginning of the staff report on page two. Um, uh, so one thing, um, Veronica, and both of you, thank you. I know how much work there was. I know how much work there was for the study session in March on all that data, so I really appreciate all of that. You mentioned that three of the study group, working group, were appointed by staff. Can you say who they were and why they were singled out for special appointments? Correct. So two members were chosen due to their strong positions um, on vacation rentals. One was an opponent and one was a proponent. The proponent was Bruce Hoban um, from VRON. The opponent was Hank Plant. Um, the third member was a recommendation by 1PS who wanted to have someone from the neighborhoods um, who was very active with the neighborhood organization, and that was Chris Rutz. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, do we have any, I'm looking at the picture, um, and one of the comments, it seems there's a lot of similarity in uh, the people on the group. Is there any demographic information regarding the members, age, income, race, gender, what neighborhoods, what districts? Do they actually work in a normal nine to five job? Anything like that? Um, we did provide some bios in the report that was provided to you that briefly discussed. We did not go into greater detail than that. Um, we didn't ask for age or whether they were working or part-time. Most of it was just information regarding um, what industry they worked in and whether they were neutral, proponent, or opponent. Okay, and so you don't know if there's anyone with school-aged children, anyone working who wasn't making a living wage, anyone who was a renter? No, we did. Um, from the people in the group that we did um, speak to, it did not appear that there were any um, low income or renters. Um, we did, like I said, randomly select, and we did not obtain those additional um, factors. But we can do additional um, data retrieval for you if you'd like that. Yeah, please. I just, I just want to address this more. Ask more questions on this particular topic. Why, why were there eight people randomly chosen? Why was that decision made? Um, we, and I, I, unfortunately, our former city manager is not here, so I can't, okay. um, you know, ha have him explain. But the email that was sent to us, those were the three that were recommended, and the rest they wanted it to be just a really, and if, just if I might, transparent yeah. selection of a lottery type. Okay. So the, the, um, the goal was what we did was we asked in the application if applicants were for vacation rentals, a proponent or an opponent or neutral, and those were put into those buckets and then randomly chosen so that we would have but equal representation and the diversity of points of views on this topic. Um, as and I think you're asking if we also screen for diversity and demog other demographics. Um, when we screened on the topic and their position on the topic, 
so if there's additional things that you'd like to consider in the future, we can certainly look at that uh, if there's other, uh, but we, we looked at the topic. Okay, thank you. I, the reason I, I raise that is just because this council in particular has made it a point to have more diverse commissions, more diversity in just any working group that we have. And so this just seems very out of character for what we've typically been trying to achieve. And so I, I know I didn't even, I don't think any of us thought that we we needed to be looking at that or giving that specific direction because it's direction that we've given in the past. So that that was just an over. It seems like an oversight in the creation. But go ahead. Yeah. Council no, members. and this kind of working group somewhat new. So you know, I think it's that's some really important um, feedback just so, for staff. Um, you know, we talked about a few categories to include, and you you shared vacation rental industry, real estate, and one PS. Um, even though I must say I was surprised to see 7,000 households are still not in one PS since that was supposed to be, everyone was supposed to be expanded to be included by 2019. That's not your issue. Um, but that's how we communicate with our residents and we're leaving out 20% of them is, um, or whatever that percentage is, uh, is concerning. Um, I know you said you didn't know there was necessarily direction on someone from the Palm Springs Realtors Association. I mean, the three groups that were most engaged and one PS being the fourth in the 20 plus public subcommittee meetings we had last time were the Vacation Rental Industry, Palm Springs Realtors Association, Protect Our Neighborhoods, who were against vacation rentals, and 1PS, which was a mix. Um, did we reach out to anyone like who might have been on the board of one of Protect Our Neighborhoods? Um, we did look into Protect Our Neighborhoods, and in June 2021, they represented that they were no longer going to be in existence. So we could not find a direct contact in looking online. Okay. Well, we have, okay. Um, yeah, and I'm really concerned about not having someone from the Realtors Association, which would have let a lot of data, um, especially when someone applied. Um, so I just want to raise that. I thought that was a fair point um, that Jim Franklin had shared. Um, by the way, did we already sort of vote on home shares or do we need to do that before my next question? It, it's probably worth making clear that um, I think we're proceeding on the assumption that the council is discussing just vacation rentals. Okay. If you start talking about home shares, then it'd be appropriate to ask that was Council my, Member Woods. That was just my out. next yes. question on the list, um, not knowing if uh, Council Member Woods was here, but we're not discussing this. Okay. Um, one thing that you know, I know there were a number of, as I've heard from members of the working group, staff produced documents that were shared with a working group um, beyond what has been previously or currently shared with the council or the public. So we haven't had an opportunity to review those yet. Um, and you know, normally we at least have links to that kind of stuff and the public has that. So I think we're getting, unfortunately, there's a lot of information that the working group had that no one else knows that they had. And so, I know I heard the reports on what it might look like if based on different density, based on how far from property and what other cities do, but we don't have that. So just sort of for staff, can we make sure we, we and the public always get that ahead of time? Because normally a staff report we would. And so the public not knowing what else was considered, even if it was rejected, I mean, the working group is a working group, right? We have to make a decision and the public has a right to weigh in on that. So. I think it's really important that all the information that gets shared with any working group is shared with council and that that gets shared as soon as possible. And I think you offered uh, um, good heart to make sure we get all that on the website. And I think that's just really important. So right, people we will have, add it um, just to our work group page. Right? Um, and you said there wasn't any analysis on possible impacts to home prices in neighborhoods which have the most vacation rentals where no new permits might be issued for five plus years. Um, so we haven't looked at any of that and we need a consultant, you think, for that, correct? Correct, I think okay. that's beyond the scope of yeah. staff. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, do we have any data on the number of homes that are currently used as rentals that aren't vacation rentals in the city? So how many homes do we have that have full-time people renting? Do we have that from census data? I don't, we didn't have that data at this time. The census data was very difficult to locate, as we stated in March, and it's still been very difficult to obtain the most recent. Um, we did find some numbers, but we definitely can do further and bring that back to you, and that's the direction we needed from you. We yeah. will do that. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, 
halfway there. <laughs> um, you warned me. I did, I, did, I did warn you, and I did share this with the uh, city manager, and we talked yesterday on some of these as well. So, um, and I appreciate you got some of that information for us. Um, was there a discussion at the working group about the possibility of gentrification of neighborhoods that may be lower income currently and don't have a lot of vacation rentals if we do a neighborhood cap right. that might lead to more there? Um, it, there was one brief comment. It was not discussed any further. Basically, the comment was to the effect of the increasing price homes in um, the North End and how they've gone up because of vacation rentals, and we're seeing more vacation rentals out there, but it wasn't discussed at length. Okay. And we didn't have anyone from the North End or one of the North End home, no. home neighborhood groups on? Okay. Um, Was one of the issues discussed or was it considered the possibility that neighborhoods, the families that are renting homes um, currently that don't have 10% of the homes with vacation rentals can end up losing those because they are more likely to be sold for vacation rentals? Can no, that topic that? was not discussed. Okay. Um, just things maybe if the council wants to consult and I'm throwing out things that I think would be useful anyway. Um, does the working group look at what other cities are doing related to total caps or density caps? Um, we did discuss some of them, as, but again, like I said, when, even when we looked at them at staff level, um, there was not a lot of analysis as to how they reached numbers. There was a lot of just discussion. Okay. But uh, you did do that research to present to, to the group. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that would be helpful for the public and us to see, see that research. Um, I know there's public comment, it was one of my questions, um, that there are 7,000 households that aren't part of a 1PS neighborhood. So if this got passed as is, once there were permits, all those 7,000 house, houses, you could have 100% get vacation rental permits if we do it by neighborhood organizations. We would need further direction and analysis on that because okay. of those homes not being in organization. Right. There was a lot of discussion as to doing a neighborhood cap versus a um, council district cap because of that. Um, we ended up going back to the neighborhoods because they were defined and because in the districts when it was um, distributed, there was a lot of um, districts that had um, already neighborhoods that were higher numbers in the vacation rental industry, and then there were also some districts that had um, a lot of um, res a lot of residential properties that were under an HOA that didn't allow them. So we felt it would be really difficult to distribute it that way. So that's where we re reverted back to neighborhoods. Okay, great, thank you. Um, a little, I know one city. I think it was Cannon Beach, Oregon, that I looked at, which allows. Um, Two rentals per month is a way so you don't have every single day during the height of season uh, those impacts of having more people for neighbors and it spreads it out for businesses. Is that one of the cities you looked at, do you know? No, it is not. Okay. Um, so on the issue of secondary use, was there any discussion of the 36 contracts um, yes, and the group affirmed that they thought that that was sufficient in controlling the secondary and ancillary use, so we did not discuss changing that number. Okay. And, um, you shared that Vacation Rental Owners Network shared data they had from uh, the demographics folks, uh, national demographics, I think, which showed that on average, um, uh, short-term vacation rental was used 19% by the homeowner, on average, um, and... I think 36 or 37 percent by a short-term vacation rental, which would seem that the majority, that the average was almost two to one short-term rentals versus the actual homeowner. Correct. And that was still. Cons did the group talk about that? Still um, making the it a group, secondary use. The, to be honest with you, we had five sessions, and it almost seems like five sessions weren't enough. Um, there was a lot of discussion that got stalled at requests for additional data. Um, there was a lot of discussion that we should vote again and that, you know, how do we reach these numbers? So introducing additional information at times was difficult because of the discussions often got stalled. Okay, got it. Um, now, on the neighborhoods, um, where there talks about other ways to do it, and I'll just give you an example, right? On my block segment, there are seven houses across the street. Three are vacation rentals. One is a Picasso timeshare. Um, so the majority, um, 
the three vacation rentals have never been a problem. That being said, neighborhood caps won't address that. So did you look at other ways? Like, I think there's some cities- We looked that, at property lines. Property lines and yes, things like and that. Yes, and we did actually, um, Patrick did mock up some maps, again, because they were not really used in making the recommendation. They were not attached, but they will be added to the working group webpage for you to view. Great, that, that would be helpful. Um, because that is one of the complaints, so that would be helpful um, to know that. Um, you know, was there any discussion, and I know we heard from one speaker on the phone, that they and lots of people they know have two houses in Palm Springs, one they live in and one they use only as a vacation rental. I know people who have bought houses in the last year doing that. Um, hard to argue that's a secondary use when they've never spent a night there ever. Um, was that discussed? Briefly, and we actually had one member who who, who is a um, who is an, has an agency for vacation rentals who stated that um, that was not true. That they knew people who had primary homes in the city and they bought a secondary home that they used when they had relatives visiting into town, and then they opted to make it a vacation rental as well. Um, and just as you as looked at whether the total cap or the neighborhood cap. Um, I think just a little more info, whether now or in a further report, on sort of that discussion, right? Because some of the things that jump out um, just as questions are, what are the impacts? So um, I'll just, let's just say I get um, a job when I'm done with council in Seattle. I'm not doing that, by the way. Um, <laughs> it rains way too much. But let's say I did that and I had to be there 10 days a week and I had to get an apartment there and so the way I can continue my mortgage is if I rent it out once a month for a week. Um, under this, even though I've been a 22 year resident in Palm Springs, I couldn't do that if someone has a second home that they rent out 36 times and never spend a night there. That was not brought up. Okay. Again, like I said, I think the five sessions were too few. There were yeah. so many additional scenarios that we could have discussed okay. that we did not get to. Okay. Yeah, I, I just think there are, these are kind of some of the questions I'm getting. Or a new person who buys here who can afford it if they rent out just when they go on vacation or someone who lives here a couple times. So is there a talk about um, sort of what I would call an A and a B permit? Like a B permit, you rent it six times a year max, and that's unlimited, and then... No, that was not discussed. I think I'll start with my questions. I have lots of comments <laughs> later, but uh, I appreciate that. And it gives us, I think, in the public, in a sense. You had five right. meetings. People did a lot of work. This is sort of as far as you got. And it's you a did, large and topic. And you direction from council, and um, this is the first sort of we're getting to do right. this. And I think we're going to do a first a study session, but this pretty much is a study session at this point. So, mm -hmm. um, But thank you again. I appreciate it. All right. It, Mayor Pro Tem. And Thank you. we are asking questions at this point. We've not gotten to our comments. <laughs> yes, questions. <laughs> I do have a question uh, along those same lines where we just ended. Do we know how many vacation rentals rent for less than 12 times a year? We have contract um, summary data, um, and those were presented. Um, so we do have those numbers right. that are in the report. But those don't. But when I was doing the math, it didn't add up. So can you explain? So some of these are from owner data versus company data. Agency. It's a little confusing. So we have individual uh, properties that are owned, um, operated by individuals. Right. And then we have properties that are operated by agency. The agency data is a little more reliable because the agencies do um, are a little more meticulous in entering that information. Okay. So the reason I ask is because they're separated into two. So you have to kind of do a bunch of math. So do you just know the number? I do not know the number off you the top of okay. my head. I'm, I know Patrick may, so if he does, I'll let him answer that. Oh, I, can do, I can do some math. Okay, I, just, <laughs> I just didn't know if you knew offhand. Not off the top of my head, Okay, no. thank you. Council Member Woods. Uh, thank everyone for their work on this. But uh, Veronica, if I can just have you, I know there's been some council direction, uh, just remind the public and all of us why we're here tonight. Because we have um, a vacation rental ordinance um, that is, um, originally we thought it was the noise, the parking, um, you know, trash. I think we've got all of that under control at, um, um, right now. We have regulations in place and we have people scouring the internet on illegals, which pop up every day 
Uh, we have a lot of illegals. There's so many websites out there trying to promote these, these sites. Um, and just trying to bring them into compliance is a whole ball of work unto itself. But we've got that going. Um, so why are we here tonight? When the ordinance was adopted, it was going to be reviewed in a year. Um, we unfortunately did not come back in a year. There were some stalls. We did try to come back in 2019. Um, that ordinance, unfortunately, um, there were so many edits and so many, so much just continued questions that it got stalled and we were gonna bring it back at a later time. Um, as we all know, COVID hit and also the pawn litigation was ongoing in the courts. Um, we could not address the ordinance during those times just due to, well, because of the pawn litigation, we couldn't address it. We couldn't t touch it at that time. And during COVID with the uncertainty and we didn't know what was going to happen with the vacation rental industry, we didn't touch it at that time either. So this is the first opportunity we've had to bring it back since then. And the reason for bringing it back to see if it's working, is correct. that correct? Correct, Okay, so we're trying, and, and um, what's not working that we're here to discuss tonight? I mean, we know what's working. Um, the majority of the complaints that we receive at our office, and we do receive a lot of complaints that the public's not privy to, um, is the impacts to community, the impacts to neighborhoods, the impacts to housing uh, prices. So there's things that the public doesn't see, and um, you know, it's, we, we just want to make sure what we have is working in place and protecting the community as well. So, you know, those are very nebulous things to try and understand, right? Um, housing prices throughout the country have skyrocketed during COVID, especially during uh, small towns that are desirable to live in when you could telecommute or you could, yeah, tel not telecommute, um, um, versus having to live in an expensive city. So people from everything I've read, have cashed out, and I have several friends that have from big cities, and moved to Palm Springs, right, um, because it was affordable, it was a better quality of life, um, and they had extra cash, and they could work, right, without having to drive and pollute the environment and all that. So I, I, I'm not clear how um, it's impacting us. Um, there are people moving here, um, living here, working here, um, and I'm just, I'm still unclear of why, what, what the negativities of the whole thing are. This is what, why I said we didn't have enough sessions to discuss this. There are so many um, additional items that we could have brought forward or needed additional help or professional input on. Um, it was a difficult topic to, t to handle. And I don't believe it was completely addressed. I think both sides um, could have had more to say. And that's why we're seeking your direction and moving forward with this. So um, there's been several articles that have been cited that were given to the working group that are put in our packet. There's a conclusion in that. But as far as uh, quality of life and or um, um, density, what, what's the conclusion with all that, all that research that's been done? The conclusion, as one um, group member put it best, is everyone can find an article to support their position if they look hard enough. There are so many varying opinions on both sides. Um, it's difficult to draw a definite conclusion. Okay, um, and we, um, I think we, ha we know that the vacation rentals generate a substantial amount of TOT for the city, transit occupancy tax, uh, which goes into our general fund that the city can disperse um, at will for that. Um, and I assume each vacation rental, uh, we can tell whether it's been used substantially or not by the amount of TOT that that particular um, um, property generated and also the price point that it's at. Uh, the price point of a condominium, as an example, might be you know, uh, 200 or 150 a night or 200 a night where the price point for a single family home uh, in the Vista Las Palmas might be um, you know, two or 5,000 a night, depending on the season, right? But I, I assume no analysis was done on how often any of that might be No right. economic analysis was done in this and, work okay. group. On that, okay. Um, as far as quality of life goes, can you just kind of summarize what the opinions were in the group um, and if any of it had foundation uh, to it or if it's a sense of, um, of that. And let me tell you why I'm asking that question. Um, I live in a neighborhood that the neighborhood, the neighbor directly across the street uh, is here maybe three weeks a year. I have a, a neighbor kitty corner from me. They're maybe here 30% of the year. 
I have another neighbor that's next to that neighbor that's maybe here one week a year. And I have the neighbor next to me who's here maybe three during the tennis tournament or Coachella, and a neighbor behind me that's here about 70% of the time. So most of my neighbors are never here. So I'd like to know what, you know, and if they rented them out, you know, there would be somebody there, but I'd like to understand what the group thought or what they were thinking about um, quality of life and all of this. So quality of life, most of the comments we received from group members were personal experience. We had those who um, were in neighborhoods where there are a lot of vacation rentals who discussed the impact of their day-to-day -day life um, with a constant stream of new people coming in and not having that sense of community. Um, the noise that we can't cite for, such as, you know, just increased traffic, um, kids playing, things that we can't really, um, you know, Play citations for, uh, but then the opposite end, we also had a, a lot of our proponents point out that our ordinance does work and it doesn't impact, and that we actually, actually even had some of our work group members point out that there's a lot of vacation rental owners who come to town year after year and do become part of these communities and partake in them. So again, these are all things that were a lot of opinions, and there's not a lot of hard data to support. And then if I look at the map that you presented, thank you very much for that, um, the purple dots, there is an enormous amount of homes that are not occupied full time in the city. Correct. Wow, that's, you know, that, that's an amazing number. And I would assume, again, I understand you haven't done any economic analysis, but I would assume when you have homes unoccupied, no one's spending money at our businesses. Correct, yeah. that's what it should be assumed. <laughs> So thank you, that's all I just wanted to ask. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. So I'm, I'm guessing this is a no, but I'm, I'm raising it because I want to know for the future. So there was not any analysis done on whether or not vacation rentals are impacting home prices? No, again, we wanted okay. to leave that to professional. Okay, great, thank you. I think it's my turn to ask some questions. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to start by uh, thanking uh, Teresa and Veronica, everyone who was involved uh, from a staff standpoint with the work that, uh, that went into this. And I want to thank everyone who was a member of this work group uh, for the work that you put into this and the effort that went into uh, producing uh, the recommendations that we're uh, trying to talk through this evening. Uh, when I look at the recommendations and I hear some of the comments and I see the numerous emails, uh, my sense is that there has been some uh, misunderstanding of what the recommendations actually are and what the impact of those are going to be. So most of my questions are going to be trying to make sure uh, that I am correctly understanding what the recommendations are uh, and hopefully that the public is uh, as well. Uh, so I want to begin with, uh, with one number. Am I correct that uh, according to this report, at the time it was produced, we had 2,445 registered uh, vacation rental permits in Palm Springs? Correct. That is correct. Okay. And the recommendation is that we impose a cap of 2,500, correct? Correct. Okay. And how many vacation rental permits do we have in process right now uh, that are not included in that 2,445? So I did run the stats today, so you would have accurate numbers. As of today, we have 2,503 vacation rental, active vacation rental permits. That does not include home shares. We have 235 applications in process. That does not include the, I believe we had 10 received today. All right. So 235, they're in process, plus 10 that came in today? Correct. All right. So that's another... Uh, 240 something. Mm -hmm. the, as I understand the recommendations of the group, all of those permits that are in process right now, uh, will they be approved and put into place? or will they be put on a wait list? They will be approved, as well as anyone who would close escrow within 30 days of the adoption of the ordinance. So while we call this a cap of 2,500, 
we would actually, by the time we process all of those that are in process, plus any that might come in from those that are uh, in escrow, or were in escrow 30 days, we're going to be somewhere closer to 2,008 or 900 uh, permits that will actually be active. Is that correct? Correct. If we continue to trend the way we are now, that is absolutely correct. Right. Mayor, can I just, just a follow up on that? Certainly. Um, I think the working group recommendation was after the ordinance is in effect, right? The date Which of adoption, yes. At the earliest, will probably be January. So given how many people are applying since this is agenda item has been out and has been in the newspaper, I would assume will be well over 3,000. Is that? Um, it, it could possibly be, correct. If we have 10 today, if, you know, 10 a day, yeah. we're going to be at 3,500. So just, so we don't we, know, but I'm just correct. noting that. No, thank you. So we're talking about a cap of 2,500, but we're actually going to be creating an exception for another three, four, five hundred, possibly more. Correct? Correct. All right. So we've had a lot of conversation about uh, the limit by neighborhood as to whether that should be 10 percent, 15 percent, 20 percent, or not a limit whatsoever. We've got 21 neighborhoods that currently exceed 10 percent. Will any of the homeowners that have a vacation rental permit now in those 21 neighborhoods lose their permit because of this recommendation? No, they would maintain them. So until such time as through attrition, normal attrition, not any forced or manufactured attrition, uh, a neighborhood fell below 10% that there would be uh, it would be above 10% and uh, would continue on, correct? Correct. Attrition, number of individuals that just give up their permit, uh, approximately how many times does that happen a year? Um, we round the numbers between January 1st, the current date, and it was um, close to 200. So about 200 a year. So if we get somewhere close to uh, three thousand permits that are active, it will take uh, somewhere close to two and a half, three years before attrition would bring us back down to 2,500. That's assuming uh, that the, that trend holds uh, steady in the future. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. So whether it is 10% or 20%, uh, there is still going to be uh, a significant amount of time uh, before uh, these uh, restrictions are going to, to set in. Uh, make sure I get... For... Uh, the neighborhoods that are close to uh, this number, uh, close to the 10% number, there's the possibility of some growth, correct? Correct. But there wouldn't be any growth that would be taking place in any of those neighborhoods until uh, the total number citywide drops down to 2,500. Yes, they would have to be, we would have to fall under the citywide cap. All right, so effectively, there will be uh, almost no new permits once we get through all of the exceptions for probably something close to two, three years. Yes. All right, there's been a lot of uh, conversation about the uh, number of homes that are outside of an organized neighborhood. And that's been a longstanding issue. And it's an issue that we've talked about at length and that 1PS has done an incredible amount of work trying to bring everyone into a neighborhood. As I understand your chart, right now there are 8,709 homes uh, that, are out, that fall outside of the neighborhood. There are 55 registered vacation rentals. Is that correct? 
Yes, that's correct. All right. So we're not going to see hundreds of new uh, rentals going into those neighborhoods. There just isn't the potential for growth anywhere in the city for those. Based on the citywide cap, that is correct. All right. So, well, I'm getting really tempted to start making some opinions, so it's time for me to stop asking okay. questions and, <laughs> uh, and let everyone uh, move to... Uh, are there any further questions that we have before we get into uh, comments and direction? All right, so does anyone want to go first? All right, thank you. My God. Uh, thanks, everybody. I, I know it's a very difficult issue. I know um, I have... Um, I have several friends who have actually, uh, who live in the city, who live in apartments, and they cannot afford to buy in Los Angeles, as an example. So they're able to buy a home in a place like Palm Springs. And the reason that they can do that is that they know they can monetize it when they don't use it. And uh, several friends, in the process of having done that, uh, then change residency and actually retire here or as we saw in the change in economy, could work from here. You know, there's kind of a progression that at least this is not, you know, I don't have statistics on it. I only know my personal and what my friends are doing. And a lot of them have moved out here. Um, I also have, uh, so they've invested in Palm Springs, uh, which um, means, uh, you know, there was a time that uh, Palm Springs was derelict, right? And it was really awful. and. Uh, we have changed a lot of these 1,200 foot, um, 1,200 square feet mid-century homes into gems that are now on the worldwide market uh, for people uh, to ex to um, to enjoy. And when you look through the pages of some of the um, rental companies, th they're glorious homes. You know, and people can leave the brick and mortar of Boston or New York or Chicago in the dreary time and come out here and have an incredible experience with Claire Story windows and all of that. And many times that experience leads people to move here or buy here. Um, good or bad, I think that's what happened. And we've had, uh, in my lifetime, having been involved in Palm Springs uh, for close to 40 years, I have seen a renaissance of this city, a complete renaissance of the city, largely due to our architecture. And it is glorious to see, and we have changed, when I first came here, uh, we have changed from somewhat of a dismal town, right, into something really special. And I think we need to maintain that specialness to keep the quality of life that we have learned to live with here, which is founded on Hotel TOT and, um, and now the TOT of um, uh, short-term vacation rentals. I do not, we have enough vacant storefronts as it is. I'd hate to see any more go vacant. The only way you're not gonna keep those storefront vacant is to have people come in and use them, right? We're gonna have to keep our parks up and that takes money. Um, I think for the world stage, an ability to rent a unique house is unbelievable. Um, and it's life changing for people and for families who don't want to deal with resorts, it's great. Um, but I also don't think, or I also have seen um, investors move in. And I think the city took a huge change. We had um, um, all kinds of investment groups, friends coming together to buy the homes, never to use for their own, never what I explained earlier for a future retirement, but basically to capitalize on our brand and our architecture. And that, I think, changed the whole um, vacation rental process. We have changed that. We understood that that happened, and we changed it by putting laws in place the best we know how, and I know there's still stuff that happens, to allow that not to happen anymore. 
So one thing I do agree with the working group um, that it says they didn't come to a conclusion is that we really find a way that it's an ancillary use. And, and I, I can tell you uh, in my neighborhood alone, several homes have flipped and I don't think the residents will ever live there. So they are investments. People, people see the investment, they're seeing the amount of money they can get per night and we need to find a way to stop that part of it. That, I think, is the demise of us. What we really want to see is somebody who wants to invest in us, loves our lifestyle, loves our city, wants to fix up their property, show it off, and make a little money. So I would really suggest that staff in the working group really look at that process of an ancillary use in more depth. So that would be um, my thing, and as far as, um, uh, the um, impacts of the housing supply, you know, I just don't think there's anything there to tell us that that's true or not true. Um, it's, um, yeah, you know, quality of life. Um, when you have somebody different every weekend coming in next to you and you're used to a quiet backyard and kids come in and they're screaming or people are looking over your fence, I get that that's annoyance because you're used to something quiet. And we can't enforce that part of it because it's vocal, right? That, I think, bothers a lot of people who are full-time. I don't know what we can do about that part. What we can do, I think um, Councilmember Kors mentioned something, maybe two weekends a month or something of that nature, if that's still an issue, which I think it is with some people. That's what I asked the group uh, to look at. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councilmember Kors. Um, Great, ditto a lot of that. Um, so first of all, you know, people said, you know, the 10%, the 2,500 came out of thin air. I mean, any number is gonna be a number, right? I mean, there's no magic science to what the right numbers are. Um, I don't think we should have 5,000 vacation rentals that rent out 36 contracts a year. Um, so there has to be a number. 10% um, was one number, right? And so, um, I just think, you know, we have to, we have to look at that um, realistically. You know, we're going to have to come up with something if we want to come up with a cap of some kind. Just like 2,500, which everyone seemed to agree with, um, that just was, well, that's what it is now, so we'll do that. But we know it's going to be a lot more than that by the time this passes if we allow new permits um, to continue to be processed during this time. Um, you know, I, obviously, I support allowing vacation rentals and... Um, I think our ordinance has been used as a model, right? We're the first ones to have done a lot of what we did. And I think the enforcement works as well as it's ever gonna work. I think you're doing a great job. I don't think there's much more we can do. But the reality is if you have a four bedroom or five bedroom house that a couple lives next to you versus if you have a four or five bedroom house that has 10, 12, 14 people 36 times a year for four days, five days, six, I think five days is the average. That's just a big different impact on people's lives. So we have to accept those, there are those impacts. And to say that there aren't impacts because we have an ordinance is just not accurate. There are impacts. That's, that's what upsets people. And I think Councilmember Woods raised that. Um, and I have not been able to come up with any way to sort of limit that other than looking at how often we allow them to be rented, right? Some cities have the number of days, not contracts. I mean, there are other ways we could look at it, so I agree we should look at that. Um, and the other thing I just worry about is well, a couple other things, but one is fairness, right? Why is it fair that a full-time resident buys, another buys a second house and uses it for nothing but a vacation rental when this is supposed to be a secondary use? Is it fair that new people don't get to rent it at all, right? What's fairer is if you had less contracts that everyone could use. Um, that would be fairer, um, but obviously a lot of people have relied on a certain number of contracts, right? If there's a limit, it would be fairer to have a lottery every couple of years, but I think that would create an investment nightmare, right? There are a lot of difficult ways to figure this out, but I think we really do need to look at what is the secondary use and what are, what are we doing to make sure that actually the owner is living there a reasonable amount of time? Because if, the owner, if, it, if it's an empty house, other than when it's rented, an empty house is not a primary use of, of a home in my view. And so I think we really need to look at, I think when we also look at the caps, let's take out our 
it's roughly 8,000, I think, apartments. I mean, 45% of District 3 is rentals, right? We have a lot of rentals. So if you, t you have to take those out of a 10% cap. Otherwise, every single home could be a vacation rental once we get the numbers down. But as soon as we get to 25, 2499, there's going to be a waiting list of hundreds of people, no doubt. And there are, I know so many people who want to get permits right now, even though they don't plan to rent them. So we'll have lots of permits that are never being rented, which is not good either. So we should look at a minimum number, right? Like, we don't want people just holding permits and not using them either. Um, and I would like input on sort of an A and B permit, right? Because um, I think everyone should be able... People should be able to go on vacation and rent their house a couple times a year to help make, pay the mortgage. I mean, I know people who they rent it out during Coachella and Stagecoach and they go on vacation and it covers half their, more, their, half their mortgage for the year. I mean, they, don't, they shouldn't have to, everyone should have the same right to do that without it being 36 rentals for everyone. So those are just some of the issues mm -hmm. I'd like to see addressed. Um, I don't know if that's enough direction. Um, and the other thing, sort of, I think that some more data. I agree, the housing market, you can see what other cities, what have happened when they've stopped vacation rentals. It doesn't seem there's been a real decrease, but that was during a time we've seen increasing housing prices. And a year from now, we may be in a very different situation. So I think that's a hard one to really get much information on, but I think it would be useful if that information is obtainable. We'll, thank you. we'll get to work on that for you. Yeah, thank you. You want to go ahead, Mary, part time. Thank you. So Palm Springs has always had a lot of second homes. I mean, that's just been its history, right? We had all of these movie stars who would come here and use the homes temporarily um, and then go back to L.A. So that's, that's been our way. Um, but Palm Springs also used to be far more affordable. And so you did have a lot of neighborhoods where there were they were very vibrant. There was people with children. Um, you know, multi-generational families that lived here, and we don't see that anymore because the prices have gotten so high. And so I think that's, for me, why I want to know what the impact is of vacation rentals on that market. But as Council Member Kors pointed out, we have seen that some other cities that don't allow vacation rentals in our Coachella Valley have also had increases, not, of course, million-dollar homes, but in certain the same percentage increase in their communities as we've had in our communities, um, even without vacation rentals. So I, I would like to be able to know a little bit more about that, though, to actually verify what that is. Um, when I've had conversations with housing groups, even like Lift to Rise, they've also said that vacation rentals are not the primary reason that we're having this housing crisis. It's uh, it has a lot more to do with housing stock, right? We know that we have a lack of housing in Palm Springs and we need, and not just Palm Springs, but the entire state. So we need more physical homes. Um, that said, we do have homes in Palm Springs that were rental houses, you know, actual single family homes that were rented that have been flipped to be vacation rentals. And I've seen that very much in District 1. Uh, and that was, that's a really tough thing. Um, and we also have had people who are taking advantage of this market and selling their homes and the people who are contacting them to purchase want to do a vacation rental as well. Now, whether or not they're also planning to move here, it, I don't know. But we know that there are a lot of people who, we are losing some of our, the fabric of our city because people are taking advantage of this market which we can't fault them for. Um, people have so many different reasons for why they're doing that. And of course, so many people are looking at Palm Springs as a place that they can afford a place now because they're coming from a big city and then moving here later uh, and using that uh, vacation rental aspect to subsidize their housing. So all of these things are, I understand. <laughs> I understand why they're doing it. I understand the motivation behind it. Uh, I think if we really want to address the lack of, of, of housing in Palm Springs, we have to build more. Um, we also should consider whether or not we want to allow existing single family homes that are rentals to turn into vacation rentals. Do we want to say, you cannot turn this home into a vacation rental if it was most recently rented 
to a long for a long term lease, right? Um, that would be something that could possibly help this situation. Uh, but I, I agree that we need a lot more information. Um, and obviously, like you said, Veronica, you could have talked about this more, you know, for another five meetings and still not be done. So that, that's a really important part of this. I am interested as well in this ans um, ancillary use because that was the, mo the original motivation when making this ordinance was that these were rentals that were going to be happening um, not as a primary use, but we do know that some are. But again, we don't have that data. We don't have that data of how many people are actually using this as secondary use versus using it as a vacation rental as their primary use. So there's just a lot of missing information that, that I would really like to see. But I also just want to point out, I completely understand why people are missing what Palm Springs used to be, because that was how I grew up. I grew up with Desert Park Estates being full of my friends. That's where 90% of my friends lived, and we could all walk to each other's homes. And that doesn't exist anymore. I just don't know if that's if it's the vacation rental industry that is to blame. Thank you. Um, I've been uh, personally involved in vacation rental issues now for eight nine years, uh, beginning with uh, when I was asked uh, by One PS to uh, chair a committee that was going to be. Uh, looking at vacation rentals and how we uh, move forward. Uh, I've also spent a tremendous amount of time uh, interacting with uh, colleagues on cities around the state of California. I can tell you that uh, it's a tremendous amount of work uh, putting together effective regulation of vacation rentals. I've not encountered any city that is even coming close to getting it as correct as we have gotten it here in Palm Springs. Uh, and that has been a tremendous amount of work. Uh, some of the most important work was done back in uh, 2016 and 2017 uh, when Council Member Coors and then Council Member Roberts uh, spent uh, months close to a year, uh, taking and stripping down uh, the entire ordinance that we had in place and rebuilding it, uh, not necessarily from scratch, but certainly rebuilding it uh, tremendously. The impact of what uh, they did, I think, is demonstrated by the fact that we are sitting here now four and a half years, five years later, uh, looking at some revisions to the work that they did. Uh, but one of the most important things that, uh, that was done then is we hired uh, staff to do enforcement. We changed fundamentally the way that we did enforcement. Uh, we created uh, a system whereby the citations were significant amounts of money uh, and that uh, if someone had three citations, they could lose their license. And we also created some instances whereby people could lose uh, even the ability to ever have a vacation rental. Uh, one of the impacts of that is that uh, the industry, and most particularly those individuals who owned vacation rentals became very active and very vigilant in making sure that they enforced the rules that the city had passed because they knew what the consequences would be if they failed to do so. There's some actual evidence that uh, we had an impact because between 2017 and a year later, we went from 2,135 vacation rentals to 1,762. And many, many of those who s surrendered their permits during that time did so because they knew they could not operate in the fashion that they had historically operated under the new rules and the new sense of enforcement that we were putting in to this city. 
I repeat much of that to make this point. This industry is very heavy, heavily regulated, and it must be. The idea that it would be self-regulating is something that was tried in the decade prior to 2017. It did not work. Uh, what Veronica and her team and her folks do is make this industry possible because we do have regulations. What we have not done historically up until now is have regulation around what the number of vacation rentals are going to be. And I would repeat for everyone, at the time that an election was held in 2018, in which the city council at that time unanimously supported the vacation rental industry, and I was one of those champions, we were under 1,800 vacation rentals. What's being proposed tonight in these recommendations is a 2,500 limit cap, and then we're creating an exception that will add another three or four or 500 on top of that. 2,500 vacation rentals permitted and operating is not an attempt to kill an industry. It's an attempt to regulate an industry so that that industry can survive. We exist in a region in which city after city, poised with the question, do we invest the energy, the effort, and the work that it's going to take to operate this industry and operate it well, or do we just simply say no and walk away from being involved in the industry altogether? We risk the voters of this city making Palm Springs the next place to just simply say no if we turn our back on effective regulation of this industry. I say that as a champion of vacation rentals. I say that as someone who spent two weeks this summer in a vacation rental, actually in two of them, one in Northern California and one in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I believe in this hospitality option, but we will not have it if we delude ourselves into believing we can do so without effective regulation. And some of those regulations have to include, at this point, what is the appropriate number of rentals that we are going to have in the city. And frankly, given, uh, as Councilmember Coors said, we've got to find a number. Uh, the recommendation of 2,500, particularly with the exceptions that we've created, in my mind, is not an unreasonable number. If we were to talk about this for another six months or another 12 months or another 18 months, we might find a better number, but we might not. And what have we put at risk if we continue to not act on the recommendations that came to us after six months of work? I'd remind everyone, we didn't rush into this. It is six months to the day since we had the uh, study session on this issue. There has been plenty of time for input. One of the really critical issues that my colleagues have raised is the question of ancillary use. I would like to see us move to a place where in order to have a vacation rental, you need to uh, be in the home for some period of time during the course of the year. I think I'm hearing some consensus around that. 
But having worked on this issue for eight, nine years, I can tell you when we go to try to write regulations around how we are going to require individuals to be in the home for some period of time, we are biting off a incredibly difficult public policy question to resolve. Palm Springs is not afraid of taking on really difficult questions, but I don't believe we have to wait until we resolve that incredibly difficult question to address the issues that came to us from the work group, and that is what's an appropriate number of homes in the city, and what's an appropriate number uh, by neighborhood, uh, and frankly, uh, the recommendations that came from the work group are very reasonable recommendations. They're ones that I support, ones that I hope my colleagues will support, not because they are uh, the best we could ever get to, but they are good recommendations that will help us get to the next set of decisions that we need to make. Thank you. Councilmember Woods. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I think a little differently. Um, I, re I really do. Um, the, um, and, and let me give you an example um, of why I think a little differently. Um, first of all, we need to know what the problem is we're trying to fix, right? And we're building out more and more. So as a percentage of the total homes to vacation rentals, a better way to approach it than just putting an arbitrary cap that came from who knows where on. Um, we're building out Miralon, you know, we're building out uh, you know, on South Palm Canyon, we're building out homes, you know, so we're increasing our market um, a lot. And we want that investment, and one of the investments, as I talked about earlier, is people who maybe want to invest in our city and have a little bit of time. We already have a process where, just for the public, where if you have somebody stay with you or in your vacation rental, you have to file the paperwork with the city ahead of time. And that lives the police to know who's in the building. It lets us know how much it's being rented. We can change that part of it so that it's not kind of a 24-7 a, you know, a, a operation. It's limited now. Maybe we really need to look at that part of it. But as far as putting it per neighborhood, um, if you look at Twin Palms, Twin Palms has Akatia Lodge. Akatia Lodge is um, uh, part of Twin Palms. Akatia Lodge allows vacation rentals. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, and there are a lot of vacation rentals in Akatia Lodge. And quite frankly, they may eat up the percent, and there's a contained community, contained pool. Everything's contained in that, right? So I assume that neighborhood and all that would be uh, administered by their management or their HOA. But that number in there may take away from somebody who has a single family home in a very desirable neighborhood who might want to rent it. So I think there are unintended consequences to putting a number, right, per neighborhood. I don't think that's the, really the appropriate. And if you have condominiums and other neighborhoods, the same thing will happen when they can rent out those condominiums. So it's a skewed number because it's a very different thing when somebody rents out a home and what neighbors feel is an impact than when you live in something like Akatia Lodge part-time. Um, the other thing is I don't think that we should have a cap basically of 2,500. We already know that's not realistic by the number of applications. They will probably continue to come in. Um, and I don't know what it does to have that kind of a number. It doesn't solve a problem. But it would be better in my estimation to say if you want to put a number, which I think a couple of my council members are, are thinking about, is that you base it on a percentage of the total housing stock versus base it on just an arbitrary number. We see that there are a ton, by your maps and everything the working group did, of so many vacant homes in this city, right? They bring in property tax, right? And the pool guy gets hired and the gardener gets hired, but they sit there, right, exclusively. It's like Aspen 
or something, you know? And is that what we want to be? We are an inclusive community that wants to invite people in, introduce them to our lifestyle, and have them stay here. Um, so I don't think just an arbitrary cap, which we know is way too low already, which has been pointed out by the mayor, uh, is the way to go. And I would say the working group and staff should look at that. We have 37,000 units um, on it, and I, I'm going to talk about the cap uh, to make sure I'm clear, not including home shares, just you know the cap of, of vacation rentals. Um, and we have 46,000 people. That's a lot of vacant units, right? And uh, they don't, they're not participating in government. They're not using our, you know, they're using our parks or services. And the people that live here off of these vacation rentals, if we cap it, get an incredible quality of life for a small town that's absolutely off the hooks. You know, it's just incredible. And we do that through our TOT. Without that, and without making us a unique place to come, that would be killed. So I don't think that a arbitrary number, which we know is already in inadequate, is the right way to go. So that's my two cents, and I would ask staff and the working group to look at this stronger. Other comments? Thank you. Okay, Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. I feel a little, little distracted. Um, so I, I think that there, there is, there's a difference between vacant homes that are truly vacant, nobody lives there, and vacant homes that are cited in this report, right? Because you're talking about vacant homes in general, whether somebody comes once a year or whether they come a hundred times a year, but they just don't consider it their primary Correct. residence. Yeah, so they're not just nobody lives there right. ever. They could they're seasonal residents. They're, right, they're know, second they, homes. Correct, they're, they're second homes. So I I, I, th I think that's important <laughs> to to distinguish. And and of course, there's second homeowners who um, might have a similar impact as vacation rentals if they allow family and friends to visit, and we don't offer those regulations either. So. Part of the problem is that we have a lot of vacation rentals and a lot of second homes, and then that's why we get some of these noise issues and complaints. And I know that, Veronica, you've said in the past, too, that sometimes people call the hotline on what they think is a vacation rental, but it's actually someone's personal residence. Correct. Right? It's their second home. So, so this is part of why there's this push and pull and there's this difficulty in, in regulations. Um, I think the, the mayor is right that if we don't resolve this with stricter enforcements and allow for too many, then we are going to end up killing the industry because we didn't address the problem. Um, I understand that there's not gonna be the perfect solution, um, but considering that this is going to allow possibly 3,000 vacation rentals before it goes back down after who knows how many years is, is compelling. Um, the other thing that I am still interested in is the A and B permit options. Um, I do have a lot of, I think there are, there are a lot of people who would like to rent it out once or twice. And, and when you look at the numbers, I, I did do the math. Um, there's, so there's 837 vacation rentals that rent out less than 12 times a year. Um, and then there's, of those 837, there's actually almost half of them rent for less than five times a year. So it's, so there's people who are interested in doing this just a handful of times, and they're most likely permanent residents. And I don't want to take that option away from permanent residents. I don't think it needs to be a permit that allows for less than 12 times a year. I think if we're only focusing on permanent residents, then it can be four times a year, <laughs> right, uh, to really make sure we're maintaining that. Um, but I am interested in that part as well. Uh, but I agree with the mayor that what we have before us is is pretty reasonable, um, and it's again, it's going to take years before we're actually going to go back to a twenty five hundred cap. And in that time frame, we can always relook at it, just like we've looked at this issue <laughs> several times uh, since vacation rentals started to come to Palm Springs. Councilmember Coors, do you want to weigh in at all? <laughs> no, I mean, it's like this is a challenging issue, right? And um, I do think there, I'm very comfortable with the total cap as long as there's sort of an A and B permit. 
Um, I still think, as I did in 2017, that 36 is too many, but that's where we had to get in order to get, get it done. Um, I think there are things we can do um, other, other than going and knocking on the door and asking if um, you're, the homeowner's there, <laughs> where people are actually saying it's the secondary use of the home on the permit and could lose the right to rent if, they're, if it ever turns up. Um, they're not through an audit or something else. There are things we can do to send the message that this is an issue, right? I mean, I have friends who in the last two years have bought a second home and will never sleep in it, right? They're trying to rent it 36 times a year um, and hope, hoping prices continue to go up. I think that's pretty risky, but there are a lot of people who are doing that. And that um, is a problem. I think we need some density on the main permit, right? We need some density. I don't know, neighborhoods may be the best way to do it. I don't think it solves um, the cluster issue, which is the thing I hear most of people, are, right? You know, I know people who have moved into HOAs because both sides, the back, two corners, were all vacation rentals. It was just, there was always that going on. Um, I don't know how we do that, and that's why I asked like how other cities might do it, because we need to do something on that, in my view. Um, if you know, it's 10% um, for the next six months as we look at it, mm -hmm. you know, but I think we need to look at it, right? Um, I think we need. I also I do have a lot of concern about having 500 new permits, um, and a lot of them not using them, right? And that doesn't help anyone. So I don't, is there, how do we address that just from a city attorney perspective? I agree, I appreciate people who are already in escrow, things like that, but you know, this is gonna take three or four months before it's actually an ordinance that has two readings and then 30 days to go into effect. And who knows what challenges we may get as we have every time we've tried to do anything um, from one side or the other. I'm just concerned about right that issue, and I don't know that there's an easy answer for that because, um, especially until we have an A and B permit um, or something. But just any options that we might at least know what they are, so the public can weigh in next time we discuss this. Yeah, the the two main options usually are either a moratorium at some point or setting a time period back in time beyond which the city would not recognize permits. So whether that's you know the date the agenda came out or some period in the future. If the, 2017? If, no, just kidding. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, okay. Those are the two primary ways that, that we could put a cap on, on it. Thank you. So uh, I'm very supportive of the idea of uh, some type of an A or B permit that would allow individuals a very small number of uh, uh, rentals per year. And I think that's uh, a concept that we can take and explore um, as we move forward. And it might be one that uh, would have some relevance in terms of what our total numbers would be going forward. Uh, but uh, that's going to take us a little bit of time to take and do. I'm really concerned about uh, a explosion in uh, permit requests from people who just simply want to get in line in case they may want to use it at some point in time. Uh, so I think it behooves us, given the exceptions that we have already created uh, with everyone who is currently in line, uh, to identify a date at which uh, we're not going to accept any more uh, new permits until we d decide what we are going to do uh, going forward when it comes to limitations. If I heard correctly, and I'm trying to repeat back what I heard, uh, there are three of us that are ready to support a total cap on the number of uh, properties that would be uh, uh, allowed to have a permit, that we are supportive of the recommendation that allows everyone who's currently in line uh, to get the permit that uh, they're waiting uh, to get, 
along with those who ha are in escrow as outlined uh, by the recommendation. And I don't want to repeat that uh, off the top of my head at this point, but uh, it's as they recommended. I've heard less consensus or at least less of a majority around whether or not we would have a limitation by neighborhood or some other limitation. What I might propose that we do is ask staff to come back with us to, with some variations off of that theme uh, when we are reviewing an ordinance so that we can make a decision uh, at that point what we want and, and do not want. I, I, say, I mean, if, if let's just for argument's sake, because I think until this comes back, we actually have the reports out and the public has a chance to read them and we get more comments. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can't make a decision tonight anyway. Um, but let's say we accepted, which was um, unanimous, I think, a 2,500 cap, which we're already at. Um, the neighborhood cap is going to have no impact um, any time in the near future, but um, you know, it gives us a couple months to look at. Um, I, I think we need something about density in areas um, for the big for the the total number um, again, which I'd want us to discuss what the total number of contracts should be long term mm -hmm. um, as part of the secondary use discussion, but. Um, I do think it creates a problem when, and we don't have this by neighborhood, right? So, you know, you may have 30% in some neighborhoods, but the average number of rentals is eight in that neighborhood, right? That's a different issue than if you have 8% and the average number of rentals is 32. So, I mean, I just think there's more deep diving to get to that. And um, I do think we need density caps. I just don't think it's going to happen um, if there's a total cap if there's a total um, number of 2500 for the main permit and we're going to be at 3000 we're not going to have any for a while and I think there may be better ways than neighborhood I definitely don't think it should be bigger than neighborhood and districts I think it probably might want to be smaller um, because it's the clustering that really right you know and people live right I live in Olas Palmas, across the street, where I have the majority of vacation rentals, is in Vista Las Palmas. I mean, it's it's the clustering. It's not the neighborhood line, right? And so I know some folks in Vista Las Palmas, because I used to have a house on Rose um, that was briefly a vacation rental. And um, you know, a lot of those are together. But that doesn't mean other areas have any in the same neighborhood. So, Neighborhood may be the best, it may be the best we can come up with, but I'd love us to look at if there's another way to look at that kind of clustering. Mm -hmm. um, because I think, um, and the mayor, you said it really well. Yes, people voted not to ban vacation rentals. A lot of those people wanted lots of regulation but didn't want to ban, and we have lots of regulation. But if we don't regulate it and keep it running well, you know, we could see something very different. And I don't, as a proponent of vacation rentals, I want to see us continue to do this well. And it's going to evolve, right? I mean, we said we'd come back in a year. It's five years later. And there was good reason, um, like lawsuits, if you change issues, if you change the ordinance in the middle of a lawsuit, like the lawsuit continuing way longer and way more expensive um, than it needed to be uh, for the city. So I'd, li I'd just like more explanation exploration of how we do that density issue as long as we're not going to be seeing more in those neighborhoods um, that have so many because it's going to take a little it's going to take a while before there are any more permits issued once this goes into effect I hope that made some sense <laughs> council member woods <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I don't disagree with what we're talking about, and I don't disagree with what the working group uh, is doing. I just um, am um, ask, asking that we really look at the way we want to do it. So um, 
whether we do the AB, um, I would still be a proponent of somebody who wants to invest in our community, um, live here part time, and be able to monetize their their property part time. Um, I'm I completely understand and would support that. I do not support um, somebody buying homes, and I know this is difficult, buying homes strictly um, as a hotel, and they have no interest in it other than a cash cow. Um, and so, but I don't know, um, I think um, Council Member Kors just said it, if we set it at 25 and we're already at 3,000, we will never lose 500 permits, especially when some, if we do caps on neighborhoods, um, we'll never lose them and we'll never get them another permit. The, and the business will die. The business will just sustain where it's at and that's it, and it doesn't let free market operate. Um, I, I believe maybe oversaturation is absolutely an issue. I would just really say we need to delve a little deeper in how we want to do it, be it AB permits, the number of permits, anything else that would lower that impact um, and create the community that we want where you know the neighbor that's renting it out. Um, you know, um, so that would be my suggestion versus just a, a solid cap that we know will kill the industry for years. Any other comments? Council Member Kors? One thing that would be helpful as we're looking at this, right, we allow LLCs as long as we get their papers. Do we ever look at that LLC again to see if the people change? Because I know with Prop 13, with property taxes, commercial property, you know, someone buys a third of the interest and then another third and it never gets reassessed. So I want to be really careful we don't end up, you No, know. we review it. What? They are reviewed annually. When annually, it's okay. Yeah, they have to renew annually. We re-examine that. They have to submit it again. Okay. Just because we want to be careful mm -hmm. if we're, you know, limiting new permits that we're not just having people sell interests in LLCs um, to get around it, right? I mean, there's always ways people try and get around it, as you know better than anyone. Um, <laughs> And um, so I think, you know, we should just, I'm glad we're doing that, so thanks. Uh, Madam uh, City Manager, uh, you've had the tough job of trying to take notes and uh, <laughs> determine whether or not you can uh, uh, piece together the direction that uh, we've been trying to give you. Do, are there questions you ha need to, us to answer at this point, or do you feel you have what you need? I, I think we've taken very good notes between the three of us, and we can um, proceed with our next step. So bring you back additional information, and we know where you do have consensus. Okay. Council Member Kors? Sure. Um, I'll look at the city attorney. So we're following the Brown Act. But once you have notes, can we each get sent them individually? So if we have anything, we're like... Well, two of us mentioned we want that, so at least bring it back, you know, as something for council and the public to weigh in on or something. Can we get feedback once you, we see your notes of what our discussion was? Can we give direct feedback just to the city manager? Individually. Individually, individually yes. Yeah, individually. Because um, at least two of us talked about the number of permits, right? So that wasn't in this report, but we want the public's input on that the next time we talk about this necessarily, right? Because we haven't seen... You know, there are things we talked about tonight that the public's never been able to weigh in on, right? So it'd be good to, if some of those are in your notes, but maybe not consensus, we might still want to have that back so the public has a chance to weigh in at a few, the next meeting. Correct. Does that make Understood. sense? Understood. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So the one question that I'm not sure that we have answered is at what point are we going to... Uh, stop accepting uh, new permits uh, to come in. Is that a decision we want to try to uh, hash out this evening, or do we want to wait until uh, a future meeting and see uh, what kind of numbers continue to come in? Um, I think it's hard to do it tonight without public input. Um, mm -hmm. I know the city attorney said we could make it from the day the agenda went out retroactively. I'm not, you know, so I think we'd want that on an agenda for people to be able to give input on that, and we know there'll be very strong opinions. Um, 
on both what sides. What I might of recommend that. is that um, the special programs uh, office continue to keep the council updated in terms of the numbers, maybe on a weekly basis, so the council is aware. And if they want to, if the council wants to ask for something to come forward, we can bring it forward. Okay. And how long after someone applies does it typically take for them to get a permit? We are currently at 90 days because everything is processed by staff. However, we are days away from implementing our new software, which is going to streamline that. Okay. So I would ask uh, that uh, moving forward, since we're not going to make that decision this evening, uh, that we uh, at each council meeting uh, be prepared if we need to be uh, to uh, bring this issue, that issue of when to stop accepting new permits back to us. And we would do so based on uh, seeing something that indicates that we're seeing a uh, unacceptable number of new permits coming in that uh, would raise serious concern. Council Member Kors. Um, I think that makes sense, but I think we already have things on our application, but maybe we should be highlighting, um, given city attorney said, right, in 30 days from now, we could say retroactive from the day the staff report went out last week, that that's on, so people who are applying know that there's no we'll guarantee. We'll add that, and we'll add it to the website as well. Yeah, and in bold. I'm not saying that's what we should do. I'm just saying I don't no, want, I like the idea I don't want to, like, blindside people, right, um, if that is what the council decides. We'll put that warning on there. Thank you. Councilmember Woods. So um, just I want a, a process question for everybody. Um, will this go back to the working group? Is that the intent or will it um, be a staff review? I'm, I'm just, I want to know kind of what we th we're thinking. It sounds like the things that we're looking for are staff review and potentially even an economic impact analysis. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I might just suggest, since they weren't part of the working group, is that we touch base with the real estate industry, uh, just if, even if it's one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. or um, meeting with their association or something to get their input. Sure. Um, I don't know their input at this point um, and what that means, and I don't know the ramifications of it. So okay. it might be good just as ancillary information as staff does its work. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So second. Uh, would there be consensus from uh, council that if there are any further meetings of the work group that we ask staff to include someone from the real estate industry in that group? Yeah, I think from the from the Palm Springs Realtors Board. Um, and we can certainly have convene the group again and then make that invitation so that everybody is you know, aware of the additional information you've asked and that we'll be presenting in the future. I think that that probably is um, a good thing to do. All right. Thank you. Well, uh, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank the audience uh, and all of those at home. Uh, this has been a very intense conversation. We know it would be. Uh, we're going to take a 15-minute break uh, and, in, uh, and add a couple of extra minutes to it. We will start back <laughs> promptly at 9 p.m., uh, and we will begin uh, when we return at 9 with making the phone calls for non-public agenda uh, items. Thank you.
we are going to get started again. <laughs> Madam City Clerk. All right, we are back to uh, City Council and the next item of business is to receive public comment on non-agenda items. Madam Clerk, would you please uh, 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 call those uh, that would like to give non-agenda public comment. Michael Pitkin followed by Brad Anderson. Michael Joseph Pitkin, a resident of Palm Springs one year. I am 57 year old, Democrat, homosexual, HIV positive and cancer, multiracial European, theistic Satanist male, unhoused, unemployed. In that year, so mote it be Palm Springs history. In order to avoid being a daily nuisance to Palm Springs city police, I protested your lack of management for healthy growth in affordable housing in Palm Springs by surviving out on the Palm Springs mountains. Every day, I walked between six and 10 miles a day. After a year, that is over 2,000 miles I have walked. Being unhoused and protesting your lack of management for healthy growth in affordable housing, I have, according to rental standards in Coachella Valley, consumed thirty to $70,000 worth of air by being present here in Palm Springs. The unhoused are of value even here in Palm Springs, California. I caution that you do not become a Lake Tahoe and find yourselves too exclusive. No one should be walking 2,000 miles to survive. Instead of a trail of tears, I call this my happy squirrel trail. Every day the baby squirrels would fly down the trail to be around me. This has always made me laugh. So it is written and so it is sealed by the blood of my heart. Hail, white buffalo woman. Lewis Schneider, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Hey, thank you. I just, first of all, I'm grateful to the uh, Council for the work they do to help make the city a great place to live. So I'm grateful, as I said. Here's the thing. It's about quality of life. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was in the downtown park. I was removed because I have a bicycle with panniers. I don't know if you know, those are, you know, saddlebags. I'm a cyclist. So I often go and sit in the park and read, have a bite to eat late in the evening. Never had a problem. Now I understand the quality of life issue with what's gone down in the park there and, and that how it affects business and tourism. I completely get it. And I can understand the other side with the issue with the unhoused. It's, it's not an easy issue to solve. But I'm also wondering where is the line between every, now, and I'm not offended that if the one, the security guard that threw me out is even like thinking on part of the unhoused. That doesn't bother me. It's happened before because I have style bags. But I live in Palm Springs. I also live in Los Angeles. And it bothers me that this is going to be the way we're dealing with it. Everyone will suffer because there is no answer. Now, briefly, I spent time in L.A. Santa Monica Library last time I was there. We moved all the seats, and you can only stay 30 minutes. I'm also originally from New Jersey. There's a park in on New Jersey Shore that I know very well. They removed all the trees from the downtown park to deal with the unhoused so they wouldn't be around. Now, again, I get it. And I tell everyone, come spend your money in Palm Springs, all my friends and family. I love this city. This is the last stop I get around and set. But I'd like to know, and I haven't been back to the park since because I don't want the hassle. But I'm going to say I will go back there. And the next time a security guard asks me to leave, I'm going to say, you're going to have to get a police officer. And I, I briefly, again, I saw there's a sign there listed with all these ordinances on it. And 
it's very vague about obstructing passage. It doesn't say anything about bicycles with uh, saddlebags. So I'm wondering as a citizen and a resident to pay that taxes, if I go just to, 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 to enjoy a park that I'm going to be asked to leave because I don't fit an MO because I have saddlebags and a, I wear a cycling jersey. So Thank you, sir. Your time's up. That's all I have to say. And it's just... Brenda Murray, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Thank you. For over 13 years, I've owned a condo in the downtown complex of Plaza. My unit is about one yards from the open-air pool patio of the Renaissance Hotel. For years, the City Council has allowed the Renaissance exceptions to what I consider your thoughtfully scripted noise ordinance. These waivers seem to be increased in both numbers of events and what during these events, this isn't fair. I ask you for just a moment to imagine a circumstance where you're at a red light and an incredibly loud car pulls up next to you. Your car vibrates, the bass permeates every space of your car, and you can hardly wait for the light to change. Now I want you to imagine that you're stuck in your car for 15 hours, day after day, with the bass, noise, and vibration unceasingly driving you crazy. That council people is precisely what we experienced during the exceptions given to the Renaissance Hotel. Countless times I've had to seek housing elsewhere with noise decibels consistently above 110. It isn't fair. I've tried every remedy with the exception of this one. I've spoken to the manager many times with the sound turned down temporarily to come back louder than ever. I've taken my screaming grandson into the lobby because he couldn't nap, which seemed to help. But let's face it, it's ridiculous. I've called the police in the hotline over and over, and more times than not, had to pack up and leave my own property. It isn't fair. The cumulative effect of the base on vibrations is intolerable and negatively affecting the health of those of us living behind the open patio. Plaza Villas was built first. I'm not asking if the Renaissance does for an exception. I'm simply pleading with you to equitably and equally enforce your own noise ordinance. Never at any time should the decibels exceed 60. Please be fair. To quote your ordinance, it shall be unlawful for any person to make continue or cause to be made or continued within the limits of the city. Any loud, unnecessary, unusual noise causes discomfort or annoyance to any reasonable person of normal sensitiveness residing in the area. I've been more than reasonable for 13 years. Well, our hotel neighbors have not. Please suspend any waivers and deny any future waivers. They have abused the privilege and proven they will continue to do so. No more waivers or exceptions is Thank you so much. Thank you. Susan Drake, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Thank you very much. Um, good evening. Um, this is Susan Drake. Um, my husband and I are longtime owners in Plaza Villa Complex, which is nestled between the casino and the conference center, um, both of which are very good neighbors. Um, what our concern is, it's about the very large music-oriented events at the Renaissance Hotel, specifically the Splash House and the White Party. Uh, these events feature very loud music with extremely high bass, which blares into our complex and goes on for about 11 plus hours, both Saturday and Sunday. It rattles windows and dishes inside our units and makes going to our public pools very unenjoyable. This hotel was not constructed for a concert venue and the way it was designed actually pushes the vibrations and loud music our way into our quiet residential location. Ironically, we hear nothing from the Hilton across the street, which hosts the same event. I've reported this nuisance several times to the police department. They were very helpful. Both times they went to the hotel, asked for the music to be turned down to a reasonable volume. But as soon as they leave, the DJ says, the cops are gone, and they crank it right back up. Um, Golden Voice does, denies that this is a problem. I fail to understand why your regulations for short-term rentals basically allow no outside music, but the city continues to allow this extremely loud music in our 
backyard. Several owners in our complex are forced to vacate during these events. We love our neighborhood and our city and the great location, um, but this is a nuisance. Our complex was built prior to the permit being issued, and our HOA was never contacted for comment when it was Thank you, Susan. Issued. Your time is up. Lewis Murray, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Lewis. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Honorable Mayor Middleton and members of the Palm Springs City Council, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. I would like to discuss the noise issues created at the, resident, the Renaissance Hotel in Palm Springs. About 13 years ago, I purchased a condominium in Plaza Villa's complex located at North El, Calle El Segundo between the Spa Resort Casino and Palm Springs Convention Center. I was well aware of the proximity to downtown where there's a year-round activities and event. Being able to walk downtown and be in the middle of the action was the primary reason I chose this complex. What that did not prepare me, however, for the pool party events at the Renaissance Hotel. I was shocked at the volume of the music allowed to be played. I kid you not, when these events occur, my dishes and windows rattle all day long. I called the noise compliance department and the police non-emergency. And um, I'm sorry. I called the noise compliance department and the police non-emergency, but was told that there was nothing they could do, that they had a special permit allowing them to exceed noise limits detailed in your development code. But now in recent years, there are multiple splash house weekends and other events. At the most recent event held August 20th through August 22nd, the noise was so loud that I once again had dishes and windows rattling. I stepped outside of my front door and I used a decibel meter that I personally own to measure the noise. The levels were over 110 decibels, and I'm not exaggerating, 110 decibels. And in case you are wondering, your code states that both commercial and residential zones have daytime maximum of 60 decibels and an evening maximum of 55 decibels. I would like to invite you, or any or all of you, to stop by my condo during one of these weekend events. I think you would be shocked at the volume of the music, especially the bass. I am not opposed to the Splash House, the White Party, or any other poolside events. I am opposed to them being allowed to violate the city's own noise levels as outlined in the development code. Why are they given an exemption? Either enforcement... Thank you, Lewis. Your time is up. Madam Mayor, that concludes our list. We will move on to item uh, 3B, which is a discussion of the Parklet program and outdoor dining report requirements. May we have a staff report, please? Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of the City Council, we have the item before us this evening to discuss the parklet program and also some issues relative to outdoor dining. Uh, and let me go ahead and begin our PowerPoint right now. Just to give you a little bit of background on this, we uh, last September adopted design guidelines and operational standards for our parklets. Uh, prior to that, we did not have design guidelines or operational standards in place. And so that was a big step for us uh, with the parklet program. In addition, we also adopted a monthly rental fee for the parklet space that they occupy in the public rights of way, and those fees went into effect on January the 1st. Uh, and then also one of the things that we did was we did allow parklets through the end of this year, through December of 2022, um, but unless we extend that program, all of the parklets would need to be removed at that time. And so that's really the question that we have before you. Um, we've received a number of requests from parklet owners as to whether or not this use will be continued. Uh, the parklet owners have made an investment into their parklet space. Uh, some would like to in continue improving that space by adding misters and other things, but don't want to go through the expense of doing that unless the use will be continued. 
One of the concerns that we've had is there's been some questions as to whether or not ABC or the uh, State Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control uh, would be able to allow service in the parklet areas. Uh, I held a meeting a couple of months ago with ABC officials and they have indicated to me that the parklet use, liquor service in the parklet areas can be continued uh, as long as the city issues a land use permit or some other type of approval for the parklet itself. Um, and so again, that is the question before us is whether or not we should extend the parklet use into 2023. Before I talk about outdoor dining, I just want to impress upon members of the public uh, and also city council the dis differences between parklets and outdoor dining. Uh, we do regulate them separately, parklets. Uh, we regulate those under the resolution that was adopted last year, which establishes the guidelines and the operational standards. Outdoor dining, though, has been in existence and ex is in our zoning code. Uh, it's been in existence uh, in its current form at least since the early 1990s uh, and probably longer than that. One of the major differences is that parklets do not require the operator to provide additional parking spaces uh, for those seats in the parklet area. However, per the zoning code, we do require additional parking spaces for outdoor dining. Uh, one of the other differences, obviously, is we do charge for the parklet space, a monthly rental fee. Outdoor dining does not. Uh, and so those are the distinctions between them. Outdoor dining occurs either on the public sidewalk or in certain cases on private property. And that's one of the things we saw a growth of uh, over uh, through the pandemic period is that we had more requests to do outdoor dining both on the sidewalks and in parking lots. Relative to outdoor dining, um, again, we're seeing similar requests as many guests are still hesitant to eat indoors in restaurants. Um, you had directed us when we brought this uh, question to you last year, relative to the provision of parking spaces, um, what we should do with that. And you uh, indicated that we should be relatively generous in allowing uh, outdoor dining to occur. And so we've done that by using the tools that we have in the zoning code relative to uh, off-site parking, uh, the in-lieu fee that we see in the downtown area, and then other methods such as specific parking plans and other things to accommodate that. And as I've mentioned, staff has been very generous in working with property owners in order to allow this outdoor dining to occur. So really the uh, two questions that we have for you this evening is number one, uh, should the parklet use be continued through 2023? And then secondly, should we continue to satisfy um, the parking requirements through the alternatives that we have in the zoning code? Or should we look at amending our parking requirements for outdoor dining um, to perhaps be a little bit friendlier for business owners who want to pursue that? And so those are really the two things that staff is seeking direction from the council on this evening in those two areas. One of the questions that I did have come up as we had prepared the staff report is um, to provide pictures of what the parklets look like. Uh, we went and took pictures of the parklets yesterday afternoon. And so we do have images of those and just working from the north to the south, we have trio there on the left Tequila there at the upper right, and then uh, Las Consuelas, the original location at the lower left. We have El Patron shown there on the left. We have the parklet in the upper right for Fame Cigars and Wine Bar. And then in the lower right, we have the parklet for Revel. Um, I'll note that Revel recently was able to um, finally get their parklet built out as they had originally submitted to staff and was approved by the Architectural Review Committee. Uh, and then finally, the last three, I have Black Book on Arenas, which is shown there on the left, uh, Las Consuelas Terraza, which is shown there on the upper right, and then finally, Fusion 5, which is shown there on the lower left. And so those are the parklets that we currently have in operation. Uh, and with that, Madam Mayor, that concludes my presentation to you and happy to take your questions. Are there questions for uh, Flynn? Mayor Pro Tem. 
Thank you. Um, Flynn, for the design standards, and you showed the pictures and the Fusion 5, it had, it looked like K-rails around. Is that allowed under the design standards? I think it was the only one that I could see that had that. Yes, you're correct. We do have K-rails in some of the others on the upside in the direction of traffic, uh, but they are largely screened through uh, the plywood that they've used and then painted or some other tool to conceal them. Fusion 5 is a little bit unique in that because of the concerns with traffic incidents that we've had that at, at that intersection, the city engineer has requested that we keep the K-rails there on the outward side of that particular parklet. That's not a condition that we see in other areas where we have parklets, however. I see, okay, thank you. Council Member Kors. Um, so a follow up on that one, that makes sense given people tend to make right turns onto Palm Canyon sometimes. Um, if we move forward, we can look at the design standards because I think hiding them <laughs> better. I mean, I've been in places, I think Manhattan Beach, where they all have planners in front. Um, I think some of them are beautiful and a few of them not so much. Um, with that one, and I understand they're stuck with that K-rail, but some of them have K-rails that you wouldn't know they were K-rails, mm -hmm. right? And so I'd like to see that if we're going to continue these for a year or maybe permanently, which um, we can do questions and comments together, Mayor, on this one. Mm -hmm. okay with that? Um, which I would support, by the way. And I think they're a great addition. We live in Palm Springs. Other than, like, lunch during the summer, I really want to eat outdoors pre-COVID, after COVID, during COVID. So um, I think it adds a lot um, uh, to the city. Um, but I'd like to see maybe better design standards for... And most of them, I think, meet sort of what we wanted. A couple of them don't. I think it's probably self-evident um, to you because you're an expert on this. Um, I know I asked you this before, um, and you told me the answer. So um, we're talking about a total of 23 parking spots for the parklets, um, not the 100. Some people think we're giving up as our downtown garage is rarely has that many cars in it. So, um, But I do think whether it's outdoor dining, parklets, public property, um, given other businesses have to, for indoor space, as well as some outdoor, have to do at least an in lieu for parking, that should probably, everyone should probably have to do that. Um, that seems, I wanna be flexible, and our in lieu parking fee hasn't changed, I think, for 40 years or something, so it really, but it's more a fairness thing than the amount of money. I mean, some of these businesses, you know, we've increased their square footage probably more than double. Um, and I know there's some rent on that. Um, I do get some complaints, just to uh, put it out there, on um, all the cigar smoke on Palm Canyon, especially from people who are here with families. If they walk by there, I know we're going to be talking about um, smoking, it looks like, at some point. But that on the street is something I just want to raise and see where council is. But I have definitely gotten complaints, including from family with kids who have been, as we've walked downtown, how they find that really offensive and not okay. So, so just some initial thoughts, but um, I know I'm going to hear a lot from our planner, so. Um. <laughs> Go ahead, Council Member Woods. Uh, um, a couple questions first. Um, so this is the park list, but we also allowed um, like um, Sandfish changed their parking lot completely into an outdoor thing. The back of Hunters is still all cordoned off, taking up parking. Um, they're not on the list. What's the story with them? So as I had indicated, maybe let me go back in terms of the slides. This might be helpful. So just to distinguish, Sandfish is outdoor dining on private property. Hunters, same situation. What we have done with both of those is because they're taking up parking spaces, they need to accommodate that parking in some fashion. And so we have worked with them in uh, either locating offsite parking or looking at a specific parking plan. Um, and in certain cases, we've allowed businesses uh, that are mostly open in the evening, such as hunters, 
to share parking with spaces that are used during the day. Uh, these are all things that are allowed under our parking uh, ordinance that we have. And so while we have allowed outdoor dining on private property, we've had to accommodate the parking requirements and the loss of parking spaces through the tools that we have available in the ordinance. So my concern is, particularly with, with hunters, is one is it's um, aesthetically unpleasing. Uh, it's, I think, a chain link fence. Uh, it is causing cars to park in residential neighborhoods quite a, quite a ways away because we reduced the parking. Uh, we haven't charged them for the, um, uh, you know, the in lieu fee, which is low. Um, and there's negative effects that are coming from it, not only aesthetically, and it's not used that often or that much. Uh, Sandfish, on the other hand, um, has um, designed something when you drive by, uh, part of the, the thing. Um, but again, you know, I think they've lost parking, which means people are parking in neighborhoods. Um, and I think they, there, you know, there needs to be some compensation for that um, or in finding parking elsewhere. But I think the same thing happens here. I think I will echo what happened uh, or what um, Council Member Kors said. Um, one thing is the in-lieu parking. And the second thing is I think when we approved the rents that we're charging, uh, it was substantially below the market because we wanted them to succeed during COVID. And that may need to be re-explored because they're getting a lot of very cheap um, square footage to make money on, right? Uh, and they're not, you know, it's at a different competition level than the neighbor who can't maybe do one or doesn't have the feasibility, and I think that needs to be re-looked at. I completely agree. Um, we put design standards in. Uh, the execution of those design standards, uh, even though it's gone through ARC, it, to me is very questionable in the image that we want to project. Several of them are great. Workshop Kitchen was fantastic. Uh, it removed it, um, but a few of the others, which I think, as Councilmember Kors said, are obvious, um, that that's not quite what we're looking for. And at, I'll just point it out, the La Consuela on the north side of town, you know, walking through there, getting the, the misters make the sidewalk slippery, there's very little um, walkway, it's just not conducive to really um, a pedestrian environment that were there. And then we have other places where the misters are just way too much and the sidewalks are slick. Um, and I actually almost fell twice, so it's a personal thing as well. Um, I don't know, I think Palm Canyon um, is too wide. It's just too wide. Um, but I think parklets are not the solution. I think an overall plan that maybe includes parklets might be a better solution uh, than what we've got. I don't think people invested the money because they knew that we would discontinue them. At the, it was very clear that we would discontinue them at the end of the year. Um, so I, uh, I believe, I think some of the letters we got about outdoor dining is absolutely correct. Uh, we have an environment to do that most of the time. I think the regulations we put in place uh, to make sure tables and chairs were out there is good, but it didn't always happen in the summer. And we really don't have the staff to enforce it, or how do we enforce it? I don't know if it's a fine or what we do, and there's not a hook to make it really happen with that. So, you know, I'm less inclined to let them continue. Um, for a variety of reasons, if you look at even some of the well-designed ones, they're right up on the traffic line, right on it. It's, and we had asked for it to be set back a foot or two from the edge of the, um, uh, the carriage lane. So, um, and it's, it's, you know, it's a little, a little scary um, in some of those things. And I, um, I think the K rails are a good thing and I think they should be disguised, but I need more discussion about why we need to let these continue. Some of them, I think, um, on the side streets, and I'll just use Black Book as an example. Uh, you know, if they pay the right fee to use it, they pay the in lieu thing, you know, adds to the environment. Hands down adds to the environment. But they leave their chairs out, they're active, you can walk by, you can interact with people. I think that really works. I, I actually think, um, except for being a little close to the, the carriage lane, uh, tequila, for many things works. I think they're misters again, you know, the wetness and people queuing to get in 
to the restaurant. They queue in the, uh, the sidewalk area, uh, which makes it very difficult for passageway. It's, it could be okay. You can rub people and whatnot, so that's not a bad thing. Um, but um, I totally agree that if we are going to keep them, um, they, uh, some of them in particular, uh, for me, do not pass muster for the image we want to project. And I think your pictures make that very obvious. Um, I believe in activating the street. I just think it needs to be fair. I mean, I think if people who have been uh, to the city of West Hollywood uh, that I worked on very, very hard, um, you will find a very active street. We didn't use parklets. We widened the sidewalks, right? And we allowed outdoor areas within that sidewalk where they paid compensation for it. I think long term, that's the better way to go, um, long term, because that street is, it does not need to be um, as wide as it is, even for parades and celebrations and all that, it's very wide. And it encourages people, if you're in outdoor dining, to race down that street. Um, you know, it's, a, it's just a race down the street. And maybe we need a median, you know, whatever we do, I think it's an expensive long term thing. Whether we keep these short term or not, um, I think we need more discussion, but I wonder about m people who want them, if we're going to allow them, more people could apply. And let, you know, I don't know, we're, we're not looking at just these eight, nine, but what happens when people start applying and um, how far do we go with it? So those are initial comments and I'd like to hear from the rest of council. Thank you. Um, you know, the two questions that I understand are before us, uh, whether to extend the parklet use for uh, calendar year 2023, uh, I am very supportive of continuing uh, for the next year. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, our initial effort at parklets uh, was, uh, uh, was one that uh, we struggled a bit and we made some mistakes and we had way too many parklets and we had them uh, be ones that uh, were not aesthetically pleasing and also ones that uh, we had uh, businesses imposing upon other uh, businesses. That's been reformed. We're now down to nine committed uh, restaurants and, uh, and bar facilities that are using these parklets. I really enjoy the fact that uh, each one looks a little bit different. Uh, and uh, so I think this is something that is a positive uh, and we should continue. Uh, are there potentially down the road some solutions that uh, might broaden our sidewalks and make for a even better uh, aesthetically uh, appropriate place? I think that's, that's a possibility, but this is uh, something we can do today uh, and are doing today. As to whether or not we should continue to apply the liberal uh, parking policies, uh, I support that. Uh, we, uh, uh, we need to have the ability to uh, rethink much of our parking policy. And I know we're trying very hard to find alternatives to automobiles for folks to get around. Um, that's uh, that's one of those holy grails that we keep working at, and some we're we're not there yet. Uh, so, uh, I support staff. I want to thank all of the entrepreneurs who have uh, made this program work, and uh, I don't want to cut short uh, anyone else. Uh, but if there's if there's more comments, great. If not, I'm ready to make a motion. Councilmember Course. Um, yeah, I support that, but I would, um, you know, one thing we hear from some, and Council Member Woods raised is, you know, they don't have that ability, right? So, and they had to pay in lieu parking fees. Mm -hmm. And I think we should at least make that equal for everyone. Um, it's, what is it, $2,700 a year or something like that. But I just, there's a fairness issue that I want to make sure we're addressing. And I love, you know, you have tequila up, which is a great example. You know, that what looks orange-ish in that picture 
there's a K rail behind there. I think we want to see that on all of them if we're extending it a year. Mm -hmm. um, so I would support it with that, those friendly amendments. Okay. Um, you know, because some of them are gorgeous and some of them are not. So I think with that, and the other question is, with all these folks, do we have indemnification agreements? So if someone gets slips on the sidewalk because, um, and you're not the only one who, will slip, who you know, has that issue, um, you know, because they do need to regulate those things and we just need to remind them of that and that the hold harmless indemnification insurance, I think we have all that in the agreements as it is, but just remind them of that because I've heard that a little bit too. And um, the only one I really have, other than fixing the decorations is, um, just the smoking of cigars, which is pretty intense at fame. Um, I'm not sure I think we should have that, but maybe that gets taken up when we deal with smoking on patios in general later. So I don't know what other people think on that, but cigars are particularly you know, strong smells and um, they don't bother me, but I do know they. I. I personally would like to deal with uh, the cigar and the smoke issue when we're addressing that in a broader uh, context rather than singling them out. Uh, um, but uh, I'll, I'll give away that uh, I am not a fan of uh, cigar smoke and uh, I know there are many folks who, uh, who love the, those, and I hope they find a very, very private place <laughs> uh, to enjoy uh, that pleasure. But uh, uh, it's I'm not for me it. to say. Yeah, I'm fine with dealing with that when we deal with the issue more broadly. I think so. Council Member Garner? I'm, I'm in agreement. Go ahead. Council Member Boards? No, uh, thank you. I'm totally in agreement with as long as we make it equal. I think that's really important, financially equal. I don't know if we can, you know, and, I, and I, it still leaves me the question of what if other people want to come in? They can still do that, I assume. Th that's still available. They'll still yes, go through the can. process. I would just ask that we um, um, tighten up that design process a little bit. Um, you know, they might look great on, on paper, but sometimes when they're executed, uh, it's not so great. And some of them are fantastic. Um, and they're great to participate in. I've eaten in many of them. So um, I would support with the amendment. Right, just one other quick thing on the new ones. Um, they have to be ready to build them, like we're in September, and some of the ones are just really, I mean, looked awful for eight, nine months. They're finally there. But for new ones, I think they have to do it under the new standards, so it's a little different. But I just wanted to point that out. I would like those, when they're ready to go, they're going... They have to meet the design standards right off the bat when they start any new one. Uh, was the were we clear regarding the friendly amendment? Yes, we are. All right. Uh, one Very of the things good. I might also note, Madam Mayor, is uh, because the resolution we adopted last year for the Parklet program expires at the end of 2022, we'll bring back a new resolution to you on your consent agenda with some minor modifications based on the amendments that you've made this evening in your discussion. Thank you. So uh, we've had a motion. Do we have a second? Yes. We have a second yes. from the Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem. Roll call, please. Council Member Kors? Uh, yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Yes. Council Member Woods? Yes. Mayor Middleton? Aye. Motion carries 5-0. All right, thank you. So we'll move on Sorry, now. Sorry, 4-0. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, we will move on to item 3C, consideration and possible introduction of an ordinance adjusting city council and mayoral salaries and a resolution establishing an automobile stipend. May we have a staff report, please? Yes, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council, good evening. Uh, this item is a follow-up item to direction that was given to the uh, staff uh, by the City Council at the uh, July 14, 2022 and September 1, 2022 regular City Council meetings. Uh, in 2018, the City Council created a California Voting Rights Act working group. One of the areas that the working group was tasked with was to identify ways to reduce barriers to running for City Council and working on City Council. Some of those items included increasing the salary for city council members to better reflect workload and enable residents to reduce their reliance on uh, other full-time or part-time work while serving on city council. 
Another item was to provide adequate staffing to alleviate some of the burden on city council members' time, such as personal assistance or shared legislative analysts. Uh, a third suggestion was to provide for a vehicle stipend or allowance for city council members uh, to help address uh, wear and tear and other costs associated with uh, travel in the course of their city business. And then finally, one of the recommendations was to provide uh, child care uh, through uh, either existing service providers or at City Hall with subsidized rates. At the July 12th uh, City Council meeting, the City Council identified some short and long-term goals for reducing these barriers to running for City Council uh, and working on City Council. Uh, for short-term short changes, the City Council directed staff to analyze a possible adjustment to City Council compensation considering the increases to consumer price indexes since the uh, compensation was last updated in 2007. Uh, thereafter, at the September 1st uh, City Council meeting, the City Council discussed these items and directed staff to work on bringing back the short-term options regarding adjusting City Council salaries as well as an automobile stipend or allowance. Uh, in accordance with the discussion that occurred at that September meeting, the city attorney has drafted a proposed ordinance that would amend these two existing uh, code provisions dealing with salary. Um, the item before you is uh, two items. One is an ordinance that updates uh, the salary and then a proposed resolution that would uh, adopt a automobile stipend. I'll address each of those in turn. Uh, as discussed at the September 1st meeting, city staff analyzed the city council salaries from the perspective of changes to the local CPI since the last update in 2007. Uh, as a result of those updates, uh, those CPI updates, uh, the proposed compensation would be $41,600 per year uh, or $3,467 per month. As further directed by the City Council at, at September 1st meeting, uh, the proposed ordinance also contains a separate salary for the uh, City Council member who serves as mayor during that uh, one year time period, uh, and the proposed differential is set at 20%. That would amount to a salary of uh, $49,924 per year for the person serving as mayor, or $4,160 per month. In addition to the base salary, uh, there was some discussion at the September meeting about a possible future uh, CPI increase. Uh, what is before the City Council in the draft ordinance, uh, there is an optional new municipal code section that, if adopted, would provide for a process for annual adjustment of these dollar amounts unless the City Council provides otherwise. However, bears noting, uh, and it was actually discussed at the September meeting, that there are some other options that the City Council could deal with or could, uh, could ad adopt to deal with the issue of future consumer price indexes. Uh, in addition to the option that I just mentioned, uh, another option would be to not adopt any language at all dealing with future uh, adjustments. That would result in a requirement of the City Council adopting a new ordinance every time the City Council wants to update the Council compensation. Uh, the drawback to that is an ordinance takes some time uh, and um, there, it sometimes is difficult to uh, bring forward an ordinance uh, increasing Council compensation. But that is one option. Another option would be to uh, adopt the adjustment section but expressly provide that the ad adjustment would need to be a uh, apply based on an affirmative vote of the City Council. So um, it could basically provide for an annual or every other year consideration by the City Council, um, but without having to adopt an actual ordinance, it would simply require a majority vote of the City Council at some specified time. And then finally, another option would be to um, have uh, that same requirement uh, for an affirm requiring an affirmative council vote maybe every two years or every three years. So there are several different options that are before the council and available to the council to deal with that. One of the questions that was raised at the September meeting was whether a California government code section, which is 36516, um, that section uh, prohibits automatic future salary increases. The question was whether that applies to the city, uh, and as indicated in the staff report, uh, that code section does not apply to the city because we're a charter city, uh, and that section only applies to general law cities or charter cities that have incorporated that section into refer uh, by reference, which our city has not done. Uh, finally, with regard to council compensation, the city charter allows for updated compensation uh, to apply to all council members following a municipal election, which we have coming up here uh, in November. 
However, as discussed at the September 1st meeting, the proposed ordinance has been drafted uh, so that it only applies uh, the proposed increases to any council member who starts a new term of office after the November 2022 uh, municipal election, either by election or by appointment. So that's the, um, the proposed salary uh, adjustment ordinance, uh, and that would, um, because it's an ordinance, would require an introduction uh, either tonight at some other, or uh, some other time, as well as a second reading in the future. With regard to the automobile stipend, uh, we have a resolution proposed for you um, that is um, based on the direction at the September 1st City Council uh, meeting. Um, the city had conducted a survey of about 20 different communities to look at what uh, stipends those communities provided to their city council members, uh, and those range from $150 a month to $750 a month, with most being in the range of $350 to $500 per month. So what the, um, the resolution in front of you proposes is, is a stipend of, a, of $400 uh, per month, and that equates to mileage reimbursement for uh, approximately 640 miles per month at the current IRS rates. Um, the proposed stipend is set uh, in the amount of $400 for each month or pro rata portion of each month. Um, and so those are the two actions before you. I would point out that this action uh, before you tonight is consistent with the City Council's previously adopted strategic priority under good governance. Specifically, the staff report addressed item 4C, which is to reduce barriers to participation. Uh, that concludes my staff presentation. I'm certainly available to answer any questions that the Council might have. Okay. Do we have any questions or comments? Council Member Kors. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, Couple questions. So, for people that are not in a bargaining unit where we go back and forth, so directors, let's just use for example, other than the city manager, is there any employee that has a automatic cost of living or other increase every year? I know sometimes it's in a city manager contract, but I've never, I'm not aware of anyone else. No, no, I'm not okay. either. Um, that was one question. Um, Two is what kind of sort of car allowances do these do directors, that's the closest analogy to council I can have, um, who, because directors don't necessarily only work four days a week, um, as the council. So do they all have car allowances to some of them or do they do mileage? Uh, directors often have car allowances and uh, <coughs> or a car like in public um, safety they have a car oh, that's yeah. designated <coughs> so um, generally otherwise a uh, staff does go by uh, mileage reimbursements and the last question which may be a little bit of a statement because I know the answer but um, in doing is there any other position not necessarily person that's had no increase in salary for 15 years? Do we have any position that has zero increase in salary over 15 years? Is that possible? Unlikely, right? That doesn't, so doesn't sound possible. Right, so um, I, I, I note that because by doing cost of living going back, that was less than any of the amounts the um, CVRA working group recommended, right? Um, and I think we ended up coming with the less than any of the levels that they thought this position should pay. Um, and I just want to make sure the public understands that. We use cost of living as just the lowest way, but no one who had been on council for all those years was getting any back pay for all that time that they were still at 2007 levels. Mm -hmm. um, so this is not like catching everyone up um, to what would have happened if we were in any other position um, on staff. As far as comments, I do support that increase. Um, I don't believe we should have it automatic, but I think we could do it. How do we do director compensation now, right? As part of the budget process. It gets, I think that's how it should be, and it should be an affirmative vote if council wants, thinks there should be an increase, or you know, there are times I know there have been decreases in compensation, like when COVID hit for many people. So I think that needs to be an affirmative vote of council. Um, I don't. 
I think this should apply to everyone after an election, um, respectfully, Mayor. And if someone wants to waive compensation, they can. But I think for some people, um, you know, and it's a big difference in their lives. Um, and I, um, and I think um, you and others have um, deserved that. But um, I appreciate people should have the right to make that decision for themselves. I think some people suggested that at the last meeting. If people feel they don't need it, they could waive it or donate it to their favorite nonprofit or whatever they like to do. As far as the car allowance, 625 miles is just a lot, right? And I'm not opposed to some car allowance because there is wear and tear. And, um, you know, I've worked in the federal government. I've worked in two different city governments, county government, nonprofits, law firms. I had to track my miles everywhere. It is a pain, so don't get me wrong. Um, but I think we need to, and it's, you know, we could have a staff person do it, but there are other things they could do. But that seems like a lot of miles, um, especially when I think some of the agencies we report to, you can get reimbursed for from them, right? Um, especially if you're going all the way to Riverside. So I think, I don't know what the right number is, but that seems like a lot of miles. Um, I don't think, you know, and it doesn't really cover coming to or from your job at City Hall, so it's really going out to Palm Desert or wherever occasionally for meetings. Um, so I don't know what that right number is, but I just want to throw out. I thought, I appreciate that maybe what we do for others, but it just seems like a lot of miles. Uh, and of course, I can get adjusted if we all track them for a couple months. That's just another thought. You know, start with something and then if each council member tracked it for three months, we'd have a better sense. Um, but it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen, right? Okay. So anyway, just my initial thoughts. Thank you. Anyone else want to jump in? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Yeah, good luck getting anyone to track for three months. I know my total miles, <laughs> not for just council work. Um, I, I think this is great. And, and I support it. I, I think it's, it's, it's definitely needed. Like you said, it's been 15 years and there hasn't been any increase. Um, this, this only makes sense. Um, I agree as well with, Je uh, I'm just gonna call you yeah. Jeff Kors, <laughs> council member Kors, um, regarding it taking place um, during any election. I think that makes sense. And not, and not just for, for you, Mayor, but anyone in the future, because um, there will be those small increases that, that come, um, and so that makes sense to me. Uh, in terms of the car allowance, it does seem like a lot of miles. Uh, half of that, I think, is, is probably reasonable um, if we're really just looking at trying to offset some of the cost of the driving that we do. Um, and that's probably better, would probably be more appreciated by the public as well. Any other comments? I can comment. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I know I uh, stand differently than many of you, and I've made that clear that I think that it is a, um, uh, it's not a full-time job. I, I know there's disagreement with that. But um, I had a chance to look at all 482 cities that are in the state of California. And I had a chance to look at not only the um, base salary, but what it was with benefits and everything else that came along. There's 482 um, cities. Only six, like San Francisco and San Diego, uh, under the proposal that's pr put before us would make what is proposed that we make. Six. That's 0.012%. And San Francisco and San Diego are huge. So under the proposal, a council member would get $70,400. And there's only, th there's only six other cities making that. So I also had a chance to look at in the Coachella Valley. And it's very interesting. The Coachella Valley is like Cathedral City with all the benefits uh, and everything is uh, 13,000. And they're regulated by the state. Um, uh, Co Co Coachella's 20,000. This is with benefits. Desert Hot Springs, 29. Um, uh, these are, you know, um, the one that's, there's two that are close. Uh, Indian Wells, believe it or not, 
is at 56,000, which is way up there compared to the, most of them are 12,000, 25,000, 14,000, they're way low. And I can tell you that there's one other one that is high, and that's Palm Desert, um, is high at 58,000. So, you know, um, uh, even in the Coachella Valley, which is high compared to the state, I don't know why it's high compared to the state, uh, that we are still substantially higher. And um, I don't know is that sets, sends a good message uh, uh, to our, our citizens. Um, and um, so I, I think, I don't know, you know, I understand we did this cost of living in, increase, but I really don't want to be out of step with the rest of the state. That's all. I understand the job uh, in Palm Springs is demanding. I absolutely get that. I spend whole days on this, this um, being on the council. I just don't know is that number is, um, I think that number is high. So if we look at removing $4,800 um, from the, um, the uh, thing, let me just do that calculation real quick. Um, we're still at 65,600, um, which is high. So that's all I have to say. I, I, I know it may not get any traction, but I think it's out of step, uh, especially when you look at the state as a whole. Yeah. All right. Thank you. We're, we're, that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. I, I just want to address it briefly, and, and I know we've had this discussion before, but um, there really is a larger issue here with how much we pay people who do any public service job and not just within city councils or governments, but also with nonprofits. And I think we have to be able to, we can acknowledge that and say, yes, we are, we are different and we're setting a standard for what others should do as well. I mean, it, it is, it's unrealistic for us to get the type of um, diversity and candidates that we want to attract in any of our government spaces if we don't offer them um, more compensation. And so to me, I applaud Indian Wells. I applaud Palm Desert for offering uh, these larger salaries. I think that it makes sense. It's a hard job. It's a demanding job. It's one that requires um, extreme flexibility. And a lot of people can't do a full-time job and this job. So it makes sense to offer compensation. And then in terms of the benefits that are added, that's with healthcare. And <laughs> let's be real, everyone deserves healthcare. Uh, and that's something that I think most of us are fighting for, is for people to have healthcare regardless of whether or not they have a job. Um, so to me, this isn't unrealistic. Uh, it, it's, not, it, it's not a stretch. We're really asking for something basic uh, and, I th and I think that the fact that we don't have a huge public outcry on this shows that our residents also understand that and appreciate that there is a need for an increase here. So I, I think it's a good step for us to take. And it's also, it is also a statement that says we do need to do this across the board with our, our service jobs. So I concur. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, it's been said and said well, and we've debated this for a very long period of time. What we're taking is a really modest step. Uh, I support uh, uh, the comments of Councilmember Coors uh, that uh, when it comes to any type of uh, adjustment uh, to CPI, that should be in a vote that uh, is taken. When it comes to uh, the car allowance, uh, depending on where one is going and what agency you're uh, uh, serving, uh, and I'll use a personal example, I sit on the Riverside County Transportation uh, Commission. We meet uh, between once and twice uh, a month in Riverside. It's 110 mile round trip, uh, but uh, I am reimbursed uh, mileage from Riverside County Transportation Commission. It would be absolutely inappropriate uh, to uh, receive uh, transportation allowance from one agency and then take uh, 
uh, sums from another for essentially the same travel. Now, not every uh, board commission and the like that we uh, participate in uh, provides those kinds of uh, reimbursements. Uh, personally, uh, I could accept that we reduce it down to something like $100, $200, uh, just simply for administrative convenience. Uh, but uh, again, based on my experience with RCTC, uh, you can put forms together that make it extremely easy uh, to uh, uh, provide the mileage and then just simply get reimbursed uh, uh, each month uh, according to how many miles one's actually driven. Uh, so I can go either way on that if we're uh, as to how we move forward. And um, so, and, and I appreciate and concur with the comments of uh, uh, council, the council member and the mayor pro tem when it comes to uh, let's make this uh, applicable to everyone after the election in November. Um, all of that said, uh, you know, these are always going to be controversial issues. There's always going to be some difference of opinion. Uh, I, I think the, I don't know, I want to get into a debate about math. The only way I can get to uh, a $70,000 figure is we're throwing in an awful lot of uh, the uh, cost of fringe benefits such as the ability to get health care and uh, that sort of thing. Making comparisons of those from one agency to another is a very uh, difficult process because they, they do vary significantly. And so uh, I, would, I would need to be able to study data uh, to concur that uh, this puts us in sixth or seventh place. Uh, I, I don't think that's true, but I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to, to when we, uh, if we need to do that. Uh, so if uh, someone wants to make a motion, that's great. Or I'll, Council Member Woods. Um, I, I won't make a motion because I think I'm the outlier here. <laughs> but I, <laughs> and that's fine. You know, I, um, I, I don't mind being an outlier. And I, and I totally get that this is a lot of work. I, but just to say where I got the numbers. So the numbers come from the LA Times. Um, and they did an assessment across, and they did the assessment with health benefits and all of that. So they did the base salary, actually, our base salary is double what anything in the Valley is. Um, but really, the, the, the compensation is what's everything that you get. So what I compared is I took our 41.6 that you're looking at, uh, 48 for mileage, uh, 14,000 for benefits, right? And the 10,000 we get for discretionary funding, and that's $70,400. Yeah, so that's just to let you know where the math comes from. I would absolutely take exception to the $10,000 discretionary. That is money to be used for public purposes that has no benefit back to any of us directly. Uh, and anyone who's using it for such is putting themselves uh, at grave risk. So if that's, if that's true, then, then I would say we are closer <laughs> then that's sixty thousand dollars for sixty thousand four hundred. Uh, if we don't lower the mileage, that would put us closer to being equal with too high. You know, very, they're very high in the Coachella Valley, and it's fine. Um, but it would put us closer to that if you don't want to include that ten thousand no. um, yeah. fee. Right. Yeah. And I would probably say, getting reimbursed for mileage for your work is not a benefit, <laughs> right? Right. It's no, but every, right. I'm, I'm right. sure that's not in any of those other cities. So well, they, actually, it is. But go ahead. The LA Times looked at how many miles people drove. And no, how, no, whether they get the stipend or not. Right, but whether it's stipend or you get the mileage, either right, way, right, you're reimbursed. Right, so I would right. take that 40, okay. I would take that out as well. But, um, you know, look, ultimately, I really appreciate Mayor Pro Tem's comments. I think that, um, I mean, I can't imagine when I was in your position at a law, trying to, like, be a partner in my own law firm, how many, I mean, and I'm not complaining, right? I love what I'm doing, and I'm in a position I can do it, which is different. But I don't think there's anyone here who has now at 14 hours, including staff, um, today. Um, I don't know. There's never a week that any of us don't work 20 or 30 hours on this. And we do it because we want to do it. But, you know, you're giving up a lot of billable hours. And that, I mean, I gave up my other part-time 
what was my other job? Because I couldn't do this fairly and that and not work 80, 90 hours a week, which I didn't want to do anymore at this point in my life. So um, I think this is reasonable. I'm happy to make the motion if um, that we um, do the salary as set forth in the staff report, um, that um, any increase would be an affirmative vote, and we will discuss that in the budget, and not necessarily CPI. It may, I wouldn't say any set amount, right? It's just, let's see what we're doing for other directors. Let's look at, you know, that might be a good example for us to see. So there are lots of ways we can look at it, and the council at the time in that budget, which um, uh, Dennis and I will miss, um, and we won't probably, we may come and make public comment to give you grief, but you know, other than that, um, I think it should be done there, and I think a car allowance of um, 200 a month, really for, I think it's administrative purposes, really, because it's gonna be a lot of staff time when I've had an assistant who's tried to follow my calendar and figure out my mileage. I mean, we have better, more important things, uh, and I think it will cost us more um, to do that, so. That would be my uh, my motion, if that all is understandable. Is there a second? I will second. Right. Uh, not to belabor it, just for the point of the public record, uh, I don't know what the cost of uh, the fringe benefits are, but as someone who previously had very good health care uh, through uh, my retirement from the state of California, I do not take any of the... Uh, health care benefits in accord with uh, the rules that uh, provide if you don't, you get a, uh, a small amount of money in return for not taking them. It's not $14,000 that uh, that I get back. I think it's $150 a month or something like that. But uh, uh, in any case, so. Matt, Madam Mayor, if I could clarify, does that motion include the modification to the applicability of this increase? The, again, this, the ordinance? Yes. Okay. Yes, it does. So it applies to everyone after, after the, election. the election. Okay. Right. So are we ready for a roll call? All right. Thank you. Council Member Kors? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Yes. Council Member Woods? Uh, to be consistent, no. <laughs> Mayor Middleton? Aye. Motion carries 3-1. All right, thank you. We have made it through uh, all of our uh, prepared agenda items. And now we're to the uh, city council and city manager comments, reports, and agenda development. And I will try to remember that agenda development's part of this this time. So uh, do we have any uh well, first, let's start. Do we have any uh, comments uh, not related to the agenda from staff or city manager? Uh, no, I'm just for the staff deve um, agenda development. Thank you, okay. Mayor. All right. And from my colleagues, any comments? Mayor Pro Tem. So I, I know we just talked about discussing cigars and other things in a smoking ordinance, but I thought that at our strategic planning that we were not going to handle that this year. But is that a change? I mean, if there's if there's support for it, then that's fine. I just, I, my memory was different. Personally, I think it's going to be really hard for us to get to that, it, an issue of that complex this year. But. So um, we do have, it was on our second page, so we had our list Council we came up with priorities, okay. and then there was a second page that we created for things that weren't going to be handled immediately or weren't our council's top priorities, but we didn't want to lose sight of them. So they kind of Got went it. to that second page list of items that we would look at working on as we could get to them. Um, we did have a request to bring it forward. Uh, if you would like to discuss that as a council and see if we, we do have it put on the upcoming calendar and you can determine as a group if you'd like to see it there or not. I'm, if if I'm, there I'm, needs I'm, to be consensus. Sure. I, I guess, if is it, can we ask for a clarification on the extent of it or is that part of what this agenda item would be? Would be us clarifying what we're looking for in an ordinance? Great question. <laughs> I need to... Um, I, I, just 
history, because I think yes. before you were on council, um, there's requests that uh, sustainability, who does health stuff, look at it. I think they had a recommendation of an ordinance and the Human Rights Commission had their recommendation, um, but we have not seen it at all. Okay. So um, I think that's where it was. I think. And yes, think, that's yeah. correct. It has okay. been through the Human Rights Commission, and it's also been before the Sustainability okay. Commission. Even though it's not identified as one of your top priorities, it has been through both of those okay. commissions. Great. And I'll, I'll tell you, they've done most of the work on it. Staff has not. Okay. <laughs> uh, so it is ready to come forward if you okay. all are ready to uh, tackle that My issue. My only suggestion, and I have some other council member comments, but since we're on agenda development, I know there was a lot of outreach, right, to businesses and residents at 1PS back three or four years ago when, you know, this was discussed. Um, we might want to at least get it back to 1PS. I mean, I meet with the arenas group next month, mm -hmm. give them a little heads up, and I think we're going to probably need to um, give more than 60 minutes when you add public comment mm -hmm. on both sides. I think there will be a lot of it. Mm -hmm. So whether we can do that on the 27th or you know, one of the November meetings, um, when we've had a little more time for that outreach, I think is worth um, staff looking at. Just because I think if we do, if the outreach happens next month, I think we'll have a much, you know, people won't feel like we're up at 10 something at night watching us, sort of where'd this come from after right. all these years. So I think a little more outreach and maybe in November when we have more time, because um, let's be realistic, any vacation rental ordinance if we're going to discuss it or what we're going to do with permits coming in since the agenda went out, that's going to be another hour plus of public comment. So I just want us to be realistic on timing. Um, that's all. Uh, yeah. And at some point it would be great to see the list of things that we said we want to get to when we can, mm -hmm. just so we can give you some input on how we want to prioritize those. I think could be helpful maybe at the next meeting if you have it handy. That could be easy. My, I had two comments written down before the meeting. Um, one was on uh, the issue with the Renaissance, since it's in my district, and I've had a lot of emails back and forth. Um, and um, uh, former city manager, we had discussed it and looked into it, and you talked to staff. And there's definitely a there was a disconnect with the um, how the special permits were issued that didn't really have the rules that we would normally have. Mm -hmm. um, I did drive by because um, I heard from people then and it was really loud. And I think the comment, um, I've been at the Hilton during, I don't, Coachella weekend or something and you're in the park, you're in their parking lot and you don't hear it. And the Renaissance, however these places are set up, it really is different. Mm -hmm. But um, I was told it was gonna be addressed for future events. So I do wanna, um, I wanted to share that with the public. Um, that that is being addressed to make sure you knew that because um, now that you're in this role that we just need to, and Golden Voice, I mean, look, I don't, we had, I didn't get one complaint about the Air Museum this year. I know it's in your district. They've done a really good job when we've worked with them. And so I think we, we do need to deal with, with this one. Um, and I think it is being dealt with, but it'll be good to know and maybe report back so residents know. Um, uh, with that, uh, the other item was a question for staff, which I'm getting questions of when staff is uh, thinking grants and sponsorships will be decided at the staff level, which I think is the only level um, anymore. Um, just what the timing was, because people were asking that they didn't know, and I don't know if you know, but if that would be good to get out to people who applied, I think. We, we can certainly follow up yeah. with information on that. Yeah, and just give all of them, this is, Roughly when you'll know, I think would be helpful. Okay, thank that you was for all. that. Thank feedback. you very much. Mm -hmm. okay. Council Member Woods. Uh, yes, if I could. Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, the um, uh, Will we actually be coming back on October 17th with vacation rental? Will that be that quick? Um, you got a lot of yeah, feedback. That, that, is, <laughs> that is a great question. So I think um, if, if there's some information that we are able to bring back at that time, but all of the things we discussed, we may not be able to bring back right, by that date. Right, especially if we have a meeting. Okay. So we'll, we'll take a look at um, how that might best you and, know, progress. Um, okay, thank you. And then I'm not sure what the We Are One United funding request is in 60 minutes. 
Oh, great. I'm glad you guys, you're looking at this. Thank you. We have it up on the screen now. So let's look at the future agenda Is that what we're doing, right? Or am I we've been discussing oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that is a... Um, that is a request for funding from a nonprofit. The We Are One United, and it is for violence intervention and prevention program support. And how do they get on the agenda? I thought we had to have three people ask for it to be on the agenda. Well, and that's actually the one that we wanted to have a discussion and see if there is consensus to bring that forward, but it did seem to align with um, some of the priorities of council and um, we met with them and they wanted to bring that forward to council. So if, if there's support, we'll, we'll keep that on the future agenda. And council member Garner, would you like to? Yeah, I can, I can just offer a little more context. When we were doing our budget discussions, this was one of the things I talked about with the workforce development because part of their plan is workforce development. Um, and I mentioned that they would need additional funds to match their grant and that they had an interest in coming back. And at that, at that time there was interest from council to hear from them, but if we need to, to make that clear tonight, that's fine. I, I, and is it going to be sixty minutes? Is that for a funding request? I is that? It. Uh, I I don't I don't th I don't think it will because we, at least from our budget discussion, I don't think it will. Okay. Um, all right. I, I just had that question, uh, and the navigation center I, I completely get. Um, uh, vacation rental probably not. Uh, SB9, that would be interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Doreen, uh, um, uh, and then I know we, t um, so the turf conversion, um, again, did we get, you know, I know there's been discussion about it. Uh, we have one, I think that's probably for the, I, the rumbling has been that's for the city to kick in some extra money versus what wa the water company does. Um, but did we get three votes to put that on? I, mean, I, thought there, I thought there was consensus and interest in having that program. Um, it's a question. Um, I think there was. I think there was at least to bring it back. But so on both of these, the We Are One United funding um, and the turf conversion rebates, would I think those were from things that we've already budgeted, right? Like we budgeted money for environmental stuff. We budgeted money for workforce development as opposed to new funding, right? Or is that that the plan? Right there, there are there is funding that that we set aside budget. already. Okay, I just want to know. I mean, obviously we could change our mind on that, but I just want to know if that was the plan on both of those. Okay, thank you. And where did dress code for airport and taxi and ride shares come from? I, 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 I'm not. I'm not saying it's yeah. not needed. I'm just sort of curious. I remember it coming up, but I don't remember. Uh, yeah, so that's when you need our. Input if we want that. Yeah. Uh, we actually did receive public comment right. about uh, taxi Uber drivers cannot wear shorts. And ta no, taxi drivers cannot wear shorts, whereas Uber drivers can, and they would like to be able to wear shorts. Um, and is and that our rule or is that Sunline's rule for taxis? I think there was support to bring that back. It's my understanding it's our rule. It's in um, our ordinance, yes. It's an ordinance. <laughs> it's like when we didn't allow... So, Firefighters to have tattoos. I, I'm looking <laughs> forward to the historian who will. Okay, I support bringing that back, and we, <laughs> and we needed to bring it back before the summer, by the way. But we can. Okay, thank you. I remember the comments, but I didn't remember. I am so pleased we will get that done before Christmas. <laughs> we require shorts. <laughs> Just on the topic of the the. Um, taxis and the airport, there was that discussion about pickup for Lyft and Uber at the airport. Is there any update about where that location is and if that requires council to act on changing it? Is it actually burdensome? I don't think we got an answer. I, I did look into that and um, they explained that actually Right now, uh, Uber and Lyft pick up on the south end of the airport. But if somebody has a lot of luggage or, or some accommodation that is needed, they know to call. They have been notified and told that they can contact the airport and they are allowed to pick up over by baggage. Ultimately, everybody will be moved so that all pickups are by baggage. The plan is to migrate to that over the next year. Okay, thank you very much for clarifying that. You're welcome. Right. 
Anything further on agenda development? Um, we just have, uh, I did want to again note that we are rescheduling the next regular meeting to October 17th. So uh, thank you for that accommodation. Okay. And then, um, so our next two meetings look very full. Uh, and then we have a study session on November 1st. And we have a couple other items coming up. And I know this will get fleshed out further as we go along and, and continue items forward. Uh, but the child care zone text amendment, public building code, update first reading, general plan housing element we are shooting for, and um, climate action plan study session uh, in December. So uh, very busy agenda for the remainder of this calendar year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, council member comments? Uh, yeah, I, I can do that. Um, uh, first of all, I wanna say that um, uh, the housing element might take more than 60 minutes. <laughs> I just have a feeling, and um, we've gone through it before. I, I would think there would be, especially what we heard tonight, there might be a lot of discussion on it. I might give a little more time to that just in case. Uh, and um, we'll go with that. Uh, yeah, I wanna, I, I, no big comments. I wanna thank our mayor for representing us today uh, at the um, mayor and uh, uh, tribal leaders um, function. Uh, our mayor, um, really um, accelerated and uh, highlighted all the wonder that we do in Palm Springs, very differently than a lot of the other cities, uh, particularly focusing on things like our proactive approach to things such as homelessness, uh, which a lot of other cities did not discuss. They talked about economic development, that, and whatnot. And, and she talked about all that as well, but it was, uh, uh, and she was well received, which was great. With that, she even asked for more applause <laughs> in the whole process. So I want to thank the mayor for that and let everyone know that uh, she did that. I also want to let, um, I, I really hope, um, you know, uh, this election with myself choosing not to, to run and um, uh, Council Member Kors uh, choosing not to run and the potential of um, um, Council Member Holstage being elected to the assembly will change the face of this city council dramatically. And there are people running with experience and some with none, but that, that's not an issue. I just hope people pay attention and really uh, get involved. And I think two things this weekend coming up that I would suggest that you get involved in, uh, in case you're not invited to one of their parties where they introduce themselves, is the candidate forum. There is going to be one uh, on Saturday uh, from one to four at the Camelot Theater and one on Sunday from one to four at the Camelot Theater. And just, um, and each one will do different districts. Do you know which day is? Sunday, Sunday is district one and two. So Sunday is District 1 and 2, 1 to 4 at the Camelot, and Saturday is District uh, 4, 3, 3, because three, Jeff's not running. Yes, yes. Uh, district 3. <laughs> and um, come, you know, come. You just come to the theater, listen. Um, I don't know as you can put in questions. Uh, 1PS is sponsoring it. Uh, they've come up with some questions. Um, but it's a great way to see the candidates, to shake their hands. Uh, to kind of find out kind of what they're feeling, and I would just encourage anyone in the community to participate. Thank you. Council Member Kors. Sure, I didn't get to hear you, but I heard um, your comments were great from several people. Um, and I know you mentioned um, Desert Community Energy, and so uh, we did have our monthly meeting yesterday. We entered a new 15-year uh, contract uh, for a geothermal project that is 100% green, 100% renewable, and no emissions and even creating the energy. Um, that will save, uh, I think, about $2 million for the ratepayers as well. Um, but we got some data that uh, I did want to share. So DCE, which is our um, power entity, um, has 33,000 customers. Southern California Edison has 3.5 million. Of our 33,000, uh, 24,000 are on 100% carbon-free power. Of Edison's 3.5 million, 2,200 are on um, their green rate, which, by the way, for four months of staff trying to um, try and sign up, uh, no one can sign up for, but it exists on paper, which um, we have to send people. So um, it was interesting. So they have 100 times more total customers 
but DC has 10 times as many customers on 100% green carbon-free power. And so for those who don't think at local government you can have an impact, um, we're having a great impact. I really thank our residents and businesses. Um, and of course, there's a 50% carbon-free option that is the least expensive energy anyone could buy who lives or, or has a business in Palm Springs. So um, I will miss doing that. Um, but uh, it's really good to see you know, our residents who have really, uh, and businesses who have stepped up to really try and make that change that we all want to be part of given um, the summers we uh, continue to see get hotter. So I um, wanted to share that with everyone. Thank you. That's an incredible number. Uh, we're all going to be writing that down. Uh, so I've got a few comments uh, that I want to make. And first, I want to thank uh, uh, Teresa Gallivan for uh, stepping up uh, as interim in the manner in which uh, you've done so uh, over the first uh, four weeks. And uh, we're very, very pleased. And thank you. Uh, I had the opportunity a couple of weeks ago uh, to meet with uh, former Los Angeles Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa uh, in a one-on-one -on -one meeting for 30 minutes talking about infrastructure uh, and uh, the two issues that uh, he and I discussed uh, was bringing uh, rail service to the Coachella Valley. Uh, that's been followed up by a number of other meetings that individuals have had. Uh, the second issue that uh, I discussed with him is the importance of uh, bridging uh, specifically Indian Canyon so that when uh, we have uh, uh, rain events, when we have wind events, that uh, we are uh, able to, uh, to have traffic move. Uh, the number that I've repeated over and over again for individuals uh, is that uh, uh, if you live north of the freeway uh, in Desert Hot Springs, Sky Valley, and so many of those places, when Indian Canyon and Gene Autry are closed, and they typically are both closed together, an ambulance drive goes from 10 to 15 minutes to 45 minutes. All of us can imagine what it is to have that extra 30 minutes uh, uh, to get to the hospital. Uh, so this is critically important. CVAG has done an incredible job in putting together some alternatives uh, that for uh, tens of millions of dollars instead of the hundreds of millions of dollars can uh, put together prefabricated uh, bridging uh, to uh, connect in the most vital parts. And I would like to, uh, as soon as we can, have Tom Clerk uh, from uh, CVAG come in and speak to our city council regarding uh, those proposals that are now starting to move forward. We've authorized at CVAG Executive the design uh, contract, uh, but uh, we have not found the funding yet for the major project, and that was the, the point of uh, working with... Uh, uh, Mayor Via Ragosa and the infrastructure project uh, that uh, has been uh, passed by Congress. I uh, had an opportunity to uh, do a ribbon cutting yesterday uh, at the Palm Springs Art Museum of the ZEV, Z -E -V, zero emission vehicle uh, charging stations. Uh, this is a demonstration project for them, but what they are planning is a much larger uh, rollout of charging stations and of fleet vehicles that will be able to go around uh, and provide charging. They are specifically locating in Palm Springs because of DCE and the opportunity to be able to assure individuals who are using their service that not only are you driving an electric vehicle, you will be getting charged by uh, an organization that is buying into our 100% renewable option. So uh, we have uh, the opportunity really to move forward. Uh, picking up again on that theme of uh, train service, 
uh, Riverside County Transportation Commission sent a delegation to Washington, D.C., meeting with uh, congressional representatives in the Department of Transportation on uh, Tier 2 environmental uh, impact funding. Uh, and we had representatives from across the county of Riverside that were involved in that. Uh, there is uh, unanimous support uh, at RCTC uh, for uh, bringing rail to the Coachella Valley. So that's really great progress. Uh, lastly, a uh, couple of issues from uh, League of California Cities, which had in early September uh, the annual conference from the League. Uh, one, a personal note, and then a, a matter that I want to make sure my colleagues here in Palm Springs are aware of that I think is going uh, to play out in the future. Uh, first, just personally, uh, I was elected the second vice president for the League and am now in uh, line to uh, become the president of the League of California Cities. So uh, and looking forward to, to adding that work. So, uh, But there was a very significant uh, debate that took place uh, at the League. There is a process whereby uh, if a minimum of 100 cities uh, sign a petition that there can be a uh, issue raised before the entire General Assembly. Uh, and there were 100 cities who signed that petition uh, during the course of the registration. And it was a petition to call on the League of California Cities to use all resources necessary uh, to put on the ballot and to uh, hopefully win on the ballot, at least according to the proponents, an initiative in 2024 that would effectively overturn all of the various uh, uh, laws that have been passed by the state legislature over the last uh, three, four years, uh, taking and removing some measures of control at uh, the municipal level uh, on zoning and housing issues. And as we all know, uh, the legislature has been very concerned uh, that we're not building enough housing and that part of the reason we're not building enough housing is that there are local ordinances that impede uh, the ability to build. Uh, SB 9 would be one example. Another example is the various ADU units. Uh, and there is, on the part of a number of cities, very strong uh, pushback to the efforts of the legislature. Uh, this went to the General Resolutions Committee uh, for a review. The General Resolutions Committee voted 39 to 4 that we should, instead of moving forward with bringing an initiative, we should refer this matter to policy committees for further study. For some of the 39 voting that it should get further study, the issues were ones of uh, not being fully on board that all of the acts of the legislature were inappropriate or were uh, ill-advised. Uh, for others, uh, it was not a lack of uh, concern over some of the legislature's actions, but serious concern as to whether or not uh, we in the League had the ability to raise the tens of millions of dollars that it would take to uh, operate a successful initiative and very serious questions as to wh who our allies and enemies might be in a future initiative effort. Uh, on the next day, it then came to the General Assembly. The first question was to whether or not to accept the uh, vote of the Resolutions Committee or to reopen debate on that issue. Uh, the vote was 167 to 98 
to not reopen the debate uh, and to accept the decision of the resolutions committee. Of those approximately 100 cities that were on the losing end, there is quite a bit of angst and we are starting to see a great amount of media attention as to whether or not uh, the league is appropriately representing uh, the need for local control. Uh, so uh, we here in Palm Springs have pretty consistently, as the legislature has taken actions, tried to find ways to make those actions, whether we would have agreed 100% with everything that had been written to make it work within our city. And I think that's largely been our experience and certainly is the manner in which uh, I voted. Uh, but uh, uh, we are going to very much see a lot of uh, additional uh, debate. Uh, and uh, uh, unless I'm hearing otherwise from my colleagues, I think we will continue to argue uh, that we need to work with the legislature, not work uh, in opposition. Uh, and I would very strongly be concerned about trying to take on uh, the, at this point, what's being estimated at $40 million as an entry fee uh, to run a successful initiative campaign. Thank you. Is there anyone else who has anything? All right. Then I, I just want to say thank you. know, I was at that meeting. <laughs> I didn't see you raise your hand or lower your hand, but I appreciate the feedback. <laughs> there was a lot, and it was very contentious. It was very contentious. Um, and so I appreciate the update, uh, Mayor Middleton, very much. Thank you. With that, we have at uh, 10.40 uh, reached the time of adjournment. Our next meeting will is the rescheduled uh, regular city council meeting for Monday, uh, October 17 at 5.30. Uh, we are adjourned and please be safe out there.